seven out of eight people are overweight or obese, which means they're metabolically unhealthy, which means they're sick. We have a phrase in kinesiology, you cannot outrun your fork. A bad diet is not corrected by a lot of exercise. And we know it's really effective at reducing obesity. We know it's really effective at reducing insulin resistance. And we know it's really effective as an anti-inflammatory diet. Dave, what is the natural human diet? <laughs> Let's start with the easy question. Uh, wow. Well, um, it depends, I guess, on how you view biology. So as a, as a biologist, if you look at our evolutionary history as, as hominids, as humans, you know, so as hominids going back about 4 million years, uh, there was no real significant amount of carbohydrate in our diet, uh, mostly animal products, mostly probably fish and then, um, you know, whatever other animals we could find. Uh, and then other things that we could harvest to some degree, like nuts and so on. And then, uh, you know, that continued on until the Homo sapiens first arose probably two or 300,000 years ago, where we were still hunter-gatherers. And if you look at present uh, hunter-gatherer populations, like the Inuit in the, in the north uh, in, in Canada, uh, Inuit, I should say, not the Inuit, um, then you'll see that they exist and have existed for tens of thousands of years on a diet that has virtually no carbohydrate in it. So other than what they might get from, say, liver. Um, and, and then it wasn't until the advent of agriculture about 10,000 years ago that we started eating significant amounts of carbohydrate. And so if you talk about a biological human diet, um, you know, what my friend Ken Berry calls a proper human diet, I call it a, a you know, biological or a natural human diet. It's a diet effectively devoid of most carbohydrates, a very small amount of carbohydrate, probably mostly saturated fat from animals, and then uh, a significant amount of protein as well. So I guess today we'd call it a carnivore diet is probably closer to, you know, a natural human diet. Um, and uh, I think though you can be, uh, to, to take the other perspective, a vegan, and there are certainly populations that live on vegan diets, uh, that's to do to, with our adaptability. But then you have to look at the long-term chronic effects of, of different kinds of diets on the body. And, and so um, if you eat something like a natural human diet, you're likely to be healthier and avoid chronic disease. That would be my summary statement there. Well, it's interesting as you laid all that out, going through the history, you got to the fact that agriculture entered the scheme about 10,000 years ago, which, you know, isn't a long time time in the big scheme of things, but it's still a significant period of time. And it seems, and I'm sure there's data to back this up, that a lot of our health conditions have exponentially gotten worse and worse over the last 50 years or so. So there's that whole period of time between 10,000 years to 50 years ago, where we were, you know, growing food and, and having, you know, produce fruits and vegetables that we we're growing, I would assume mostly vegetables, but why the sudden drop in our health about 50 years ago, given that fact? One, there's two things you have to look at here. One is up until, you know, the 1940s, 50s, people just didn't live that long. You know, the average lifespan in North America was still in the 50s, you know, so I would be a very old man. I'm in my 60s now, uh, it, you know, uh, 70 or 80 years ago. So what we have seen is a, is a tremendous increase in our longevity. Uh, the biggest significant increase uh, ever in humanity in just the last hundred years or so. And so what happens then is the chronic diseases that tend to plague us as we get older become more prominent. Those are things like cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, uh, diabetes, um, Alzheimer's. Uh, they become more prominent. And so we're looking at an increase in those kinds of diseases of aging, if you like, uh, I think they can largely be avoided, is associated with our increase in longevity. So, but if you look at the diet people were eating, um, you know, even up until the mid-1950s, uh, it wasn't a diet terribly high in, in carbohydrate. And it's interesting you mentioned 50 years ago, because it was about 43 years ago that the first American dietary guidelines came out. And before that, people were eating lots of eggs and saturated fat and meat and that sort of thing. And sure, they were eating bread and other carbs and some sweets and so on, but usually just on holidays and dessert was a once a week thing, not three times a day or for breakfast. So many of those wild breakfast foods that are supposed to be nutri, you know, they're, they're basically dessert that you're having for breakfast. So, um, so it was much more rare. And, and, and in 1980, that's when the first US, U.S. dietary guidelines came out, which were not science-based. 
and they asked us to reduce our consumption of saturated fats in particular and, and therefore increase carbohydrates uh, to compensate. And, and that's where I think you see the increase in, in obesity and the associated chronic diseases, uh, again, cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, even Alzheimer's are associated with the, the same the same problem. I view it all as one disease, Jesse. It's it's a it's really metabolic disease. So I think you've had some some previous guests on recently that have talked about the fact that um, in and we could talk about North America probably in 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 the same uh, breath here. Uh, over eighty percent, maybe eighty two percent, or maybe even eighty eight percent of the population are in poor metabolic health. In other words, you know you have your so called the the, you know, the ultimate health broadcast. I, I I talk to you about optimal health. So how do you optimize your health given the genes that you are dealt in life? And uh, so to have the ultimate health, you know, you need to address metabolic disease, which means for seven out of eight of us, we have a problem that needs to be addressed. Well, it's interesting you bring up the dietary guidelines and that being a catalyst for, you know, the predicament we're in these days with our health deteriorating. You have a graph in the book that depicts that very well, where you can see the guidelines come in and then things just skyrocket when it comes to chronic disease, which is really sad in a way, because what that alludes to is the fact that people are taking what's been told to them and applying it and trying, but they're given the wrong information. So a lot of times in the health and wellness space, I feel like people, when they they gain weight and they're obese, as a whole humans look at them like they're lacking discipline or it's their fault. But this chart in your book clearly, clearly depicts the fact that we're following what we're being told. So it's really not people's fault for the fact that their health is falling apart when you look at it that way. Absolutely. You know, I couldn't agree more. And, and um, you know, often when I speak, uh, there, there are many people because I, I, you know, I, I speak about well-formulated ketogenic diets, and I would argue that probably 90, 95% of people that are interested, it's because they're overweight or obese, and they've learned that it's an effective way to, to manage their weight. Uh, so the first thing I do is apologize. And I, you know, if, if you've looked at my book, the first thing I do basically is apologize for teaching the wrong thing to my students for 30 years. You know, a couple generations of students that I taught that a, you know, low-fat, high-carb diet was, was the healthy diet. Um, uh, which is this, the diet that's still recommended by our policymakers, you know, in government, Health Canada here in Canada, or, you know, National Institutes of Health in the U.S. and the U.S. FDA, um, they still promote a high-carb, low-fat diet. And, and, and so that's when that started. And there's, a, there's an interesting story behind it and why it came out, which is quite political, but um, it really came from a hypothesis, the diet heart hypothesis or diet lipid heart hypothesis of Ansel Keys. And, and he uh, posited that it was high cholesterol in our diet and high saturated fat was causing heart disease. And, and that was actually precipitated by uh, Eisenhower, who had a heart attack while in office. So people started to become interested in why a relatively young man in his 50s would have a heart attack. So he came up with this hypothesis and tried to test it and basically, you know, kind of cherry pick the data that he collected and uh, and and I would say manipulated it and and rather than go out and with an objective mind trying to find the truth, he went out to try to prove what he had already said was correct, which is terrible science. But he was able to take over organizations like the American Heart Association and others and drum anybody who disagreed out of those organizations, and then that became the sort of uh, I guess the nutritional zeitgeist going forward was that. That um, and and to some degree, Jesse, it made sense because you go, okay, people, uh, if they're obese, well, they're eating too much, and well, let's look at what they're eating. Well, fat is the highest density food, so if you take the fat out of the diet, it should make sense. So then we blame them for eating the wrong diet, right? Or we say, you know, it's calories in, calories out. So uh, you're fat because you're lazy, which is absolutely not right. Uh, most of your weight management is about what you eat, not you know, your output. But of course, people should exercise. I'm a kinesiology professor, and I would never, never, ever counsel people that they don't have to exercise. It has all, all sorts of benefits, but it's not a way to manage weight. Um, and we just went with that theory. So now we have several generations of dietitians and nutrition scientists and so on that believe this and get their funding from organizations that believe this. Uh, so for our work on the therapeutic benefits of ketogenic diets, we have to go to private funding organizations. We can't get funded by public funders because they would be 
funding things that are contrary to their own public statements, and they won't do that for political reasons. So unfortunately, overall, nutrition is a hugely political, hugely personal issue. And the reason I apologized was I taught a model that was never validated for about 25 years without ever looking at the primary research to see if there was any evidence behind it. And I spent probably five or six years, Jesse, I could save your listeners some time looking for that evidence, and it's just not there. In fact, since early 2000s and the uh, the Women's Health Study and so on in the States, um, we've, we've discovered and we've known for 20 years that saturated fats are, are not correlated to heart disease or any other disease on their own. There are, you know, better fats and so on, but but saturated fat was not the enemy. The enemy was always sugar and the sugar lobby was strong then and the fat people in the, the, the fat was bad people in science and the, you know, drum them out as well. So had we listened to the other argument in the day, seven in the 70s, uh, that it was actually sugar that was causing a lot of these problems, we could have changed that whole hockey stick diagram of obesity and chronic disease that we're experiencing now. I just took a peek at the latest YouTube stats and 87.3% of the people that are watching these videos aren't subscribed to the channel. If you're in this group, do me a favor and take a second and subscribe below. This is going to help the community continue to grow and help the show continue to bring on the biggest guests. Thank you ahead of time. Continue to enjoy this conversation with Dave. You talked about the fact that Ansel Keys cherry picked the data when he was, you know, taking the results and, and sharing them with the public. Do you think in his heart he felt like he was doing the right thing? Obviously, we're not going to be able to determine for sure. But in your opinion, do you feel like the way he manipulated that data, he thought he was doing it correctly or was he doing it with bad intent? Well, I think initially, and I'm going to be, uh, you know, I think he was a scientist. In fact, his background was much like mine. He started in animal physiology and went to Cambridge as I did and then, you know, came into nutrition science later. He's certainly an accomplished uh, physiologist uh, and well-respected. Um, in fact, so well-respected. You've heard of K rations, you know, for the military. That K is from Keys. He designed the food that people still, you know, were eating in the World War II, which was basically chocolate bars and candy and stuff like that. Uh, so, um, no, I, I don't think initially. I think, in, uh, of course, as a scientist, I'm going to say his initial motivation was to try and help people. And that's, you know, what I'm trying to do, too, is correct the record and help people to, you know, get on a path towards uh, a healthy lifestyle by avoiding the mistake we made. So in science, um, and, and that's my perspective on this. I, I don't really, other yeah, than my book, I don't really sell anything. Uh, the work I do in counseling is pro bono for women with metastatic breast cancer and uh, I'm not, you know, I have my own career and I don't need, I'm not trying to sell anybody anything other than the fact that we need to make objective science-based recommendations for people. And so in science, if you have a present model and new information comes that uh, supports a different model, then good science says you must reject the present model and accept the new model as the latest. We're never finished doing science. It's always a work in process. And nutritional science is particularly uh, mucky and difficult and expensive because people have to eat, so it's hard to control things. But that's what I did. I had a model of uh, nutrition science, and I realized it was wrong. I had an amazing aha moment where I realized, oh my God, I've had it wrong for all these years, and I've been teaching people. I have to apologize. <laughs> that's the first thing I have to do. And when I speak to people in the audience, and I, lots of people are, are obese and overweight, I say, I'm to blame. I was part of a system that supported the present dietary recommendations for a high carbohydrate, low fat diet, and it's made you sick because you know obesity is defined as an illness. And 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 I have to apologize. And I'm trying to set the record straight. And I'm trying to point you now in the right direction. So, I think the problem with Ansel Keys was once he had his idea, he stopped doing good science, and he was more interested in his own reputation and his own power within science. And I I only read about him. I never met him, obviously, but uh, he was something of an academic bully, we would call today. Anybody who disagreed with him, he would get together with his friends and he'd, he'd drum them out and they couldn't get published and they couldn't get funded. And to a large degree, we're still doing that. You know, I work with, with Jeff Volick at The Ohio State University on our uh, breast cancer study. And, you know, Jeff is one of, I would say, one of the best scientists, full stop on the planet right now. He's doing amazing work. 
And he has trouble getting funded from the United States because, again, it's contrary. Although he does get funding from certain branches of the of the U.S. government, but not from the USDA or not from the National Institutes of Health because um, because it's contrary to the other stuff they're funding. So, so the debate in nutrition is not a healthy scientific debate, and it and it and so you need to advocate. So I am fully an advocate for the health benefits of a well formulated ketogenic diet, and I'll say that right up front. And then we can talk more about what that means as we uh, as we carry on. Well, let's come back to your story and talk about that epiphany moment. You've referred to it a couple times where you were teaching the opposite, and then all of a sudden things switch for you. So, what was that moment for you? Yeah, it was. I, I you know you have these aha moments in life. So, so you have to remember, I've been teaching. I trained in anatomy and physiology. I teach. I teach health. I teach anatomy, physiology, pathology, and nutrition. Uh, as a kinesiology professor, and I've been doing this for decades. And I had a radio show. Uh, it was called Think for Yourself, a show about uh, critical reasoning and looking at mostly current events. So we we had one episode that was about obesity. And uh, this was, oh, 15 years ago, probably. And um, so we had a guest on uh, named Dr. Richard Mathias, who is a physician and uh, at the School of Public Health at the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver, where I live. Uh, very accomplished, and most of his research had been on uh, indigenous diets, particularly in the West Coast, but also Inuit diet, um, which is, again, the West Coast diet is, is largely fish, a lot of fish and, and game and so on, and they do have, you know, berries and, 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 and other greens and things that they eat, but it's, it's very high-fat, high-carb diet. So that was his background. I was coming in as a kinesiology professor, and, and so, y- you know, I was going to take the exercise kind of side of things, and and so we started off, we had a little meeting before the show, as we do on these things. And then uh, on the air, he said, um, so Dave, what do you think actually causes obesity? And I spouted the party line, which you can actually almost verbatim see anywhere. It's a very complicated multifactorial disease involving psychosocial factors and metabolic factors and genetic factors and lifestyle factors. And it's very complicated. And it's going to take tons of studying to ever figure this out. I hope we can do that. And he just looked at me, wait till I finished. And he said, Dave, it's simpler than that. It's your body's reaction to excess carbohydrate in the diet. And I you know, like we're doing now, dead air, they call it, bad for radio, right? It's when, you know, people are seeing if they're still tuned in. Because I, my brain was going, oh my God, like all of the information I had was now processing, you know, and when my parietal lobes and all of a sudden I thought, oh my God, he's, he's right. And I never thought of the problem that way. But because I did understand human physiology, I realized at that time that what he, what he was saying made perfect sense. And then he introduced me to people like Jeff Volek and Steve Finney and and uh, uh, Eric Westman and so on, many of whom you've had on your show. I think Dr. Westman was on fairly recently. Uh, um, and uh, and I realized that there is actually a new science of nutrition, which has rejected the old model, which never worked and was in fact making people sick because they're eating these high carb, high carb low fat diets. See that in the grocery stores. Um, and in fact, it wasn't working. So So in effect... Jesse, what we did, thanks to Ansel Keys and the U.S. Dietary Guidelines and a few government officials, is we conducted a massive experiment in the West, in North America, telling everybody to eat a low-fat, high-carb diet because it was going to make you healthier. And what happened was exactly the opposite. It made people unhealthy. So for heaven's sakes, what we have to do now is reject that model. We know it doesn't work. We know why. It's called the carbohydrate insulin model or the hormonal model for obesity. I would say anybody who looks at the data objectively would agree that that's the model that works, both clinically and um, theoretically, and that this old calories in, calories out, you know, low fat, high carb diet stuff absolutely does not work. And in fact, I would argue is dangerous. It's making people sick and it's it's shortening their lives. So it's killing people. So if we go wind that back to Ansel Keys, you know, what he was doing may be responsible for more premature deaths than basically anybody in history. Well, it's interesting. We've addressed one. <laughs> That's saying a lot. <laughs> we've addressed one elephant in the room: the fact that these dietary guidelines come out and they're telling people eat a lot of carbs, cut down on fat. I think the other piece of that that happened around that time is processed foods. So these get you know put into the public realm in a major way. High in sugar, technology is allowing us to really you know basically put out these chemical food-like substances 
And then you have this tied into that whole mix where people are being told to to leave the fat alone and and eat more carbs. Yeah, and and a shout out to um uh to Michael Moss who wrote the Salt Sugar Fat, which was very popular. Uh, we talked about the processed food industry and how they manipulate food, and they they quite literally make food that you can't stop eating. And and if we look at the you know transactionally. Um, Real estate is the most valuable business on the planet. But after that, the most the most valuable transactional business that you spend money on all the time is food. We spend more money on food than anything else. And so it's the biggest business on the planet in many ways. Everybody has to eat. And I think it's something like $7 trillion a year, about $3 trillion of which is processed food. And it's controlled by about a dozen companies. I mean, there are more, but 90% of the market is controlled by about a dozen companies who do collude and compete uh, at the same time. Uh, but they um, they don't like what I say because, you know, well-formulated ketogenic diet has no processed food except for things like cheese and wine, perhaps. Um, and and so they don't like what I have to say. Which, but if if you if you know about how the processed food industry works, there, there's, a, there's a fellow named Howard Moscovich in, in Minnesota. And what he does is design food for specific geographical areas that is uh, that uh, peaks their taste buds in those particular areas. So in other words, cornflakes taste different in Quebec where people like high salty food than it does on the West Coast where people don't like as much salt in their food. So the and and he actually his his claim to fame was Dr. Pepper. You know, he invented the taste for Dr. Pepper that and so what they do is they manipulate the taste of food. You think of something, I won't say a name brand, but a, a cookie, you know, a name brand cookie, and you eat it and you go, yeah, it's not very tasty. You know, I make much better cookies myself. And and then you eat another one and then you've eaten a row and then you've eaten another row because it's designed to work with your brain so that you can't actually stop eating it. And so we have a food industry that has no interest in your health that's designing food you can't stop eating. And then we have a healthcare industry that's fixed with a model that's telling you to eat the wrong foods and, and, uh, and doesn't really educate our physicians in nutrition. And as a result, we have a massive population of overweight and obese people. I think overweight and obese in 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 U.S. now is above eighty two percent. So again, it's about seven out of eight people are overweight or obese, which means they're metabolically unhealthy, which means they're sick. And this is different from. I don't want to get into. Um, you know, I don't want to have anybody say you're you're fat shaming me. I'm not fat shaming you. I'm I'm apologizing. <laughs> I'm apologizing to you, but telling you that you do have to change the way you're eating if you want to address the obesity issue. It's an it's an 80-20 rule. Well, obesity is about 80% what you're eating, about 20% what your your exercise output. So we need to look at your diet and and the great news Jesse is for decades now we've been experimenting with uh well formulated ketogenic diets and by the by the way well formulated means that it's designed so that it has all of the nutrients and minerals and things that you need, all the vitamins, minerals, and, and so on that you need. It can be completely devoid of carbohydrates because there are no essential carbohydrates. And people think there are, well, what about fiber? Well, fiber is probably fine, but it's not essential. You don't have to eat it. You need to eat proteins because there are certain amino acids we can't synthesize. And we need to eat uh, fats, uh, especially um, some of the saturated fats like omega-3 because we, uh, sorry, omega-3 is not saturated, but we need to uh, eat fats because they provide, um, there there are essential fatty acids that we need as well. And and if you look at those, going back to the original uh, start of the discussion, those hunter-gatherer people, they tend to eat between about 60 and 90 percent of their calories are fat, up to 90 percent uh, for uh, some Inuit. And, and the rest is protein, and, and, and it can be a very small amount, 5% or less of carbohydrate. And that's somehow, people say, well, there's no long-term experiments to show that these diets are safe. And I said, well, what about, like, life? <laughs> that that, that 300,000-year experiment that we had with humans, and we were doing just fine, thank you very much, until agriculture came along. And that's what we, we needed because we had larger populations, we had division of labor, we needed to have a food that provided calories, energy that we could carry around with us and store and so on. And, and grains are really good for that. So we started growing wheat and other grains. And, and some people can metabolize those pretty well. Uh, some can't. But they will give you a bolus of carbohydrate in your system when digested and absorbed. And your body has to deal with that unnaturally high amount of carbohydrate in your system. Well, I think a good place to go from here is talk about what happens 
when somebody ingests carbohydrates. And you do a great job of this in the book, taking glucose and taking us through all the physiology in the body. So let's do that here. Let's talk about, because we've talked about how we're eating too many carbs. Let's talk about where things go awry in the body, taking a carbohydrate right through the system. Sure. Oh, no, it's fun. And I, I in the book, I use, uh, the bio, book's called Biodiet, by the way. It's been out for a few years now, but... Um, and, um, so I, I use the analogy of, of, um, uh, fantastic voyage, which was a film I saw when they redid it, I think in the eighties or nineties, but it was a film where they shrunk these scientists down, uh, and, and injected them microscopically into this, um, into this person's body. He was a diplomat and they had to go and like fix something in his brain or whatever. And that's the only way they could do it. Right. So. So, but what it did is give, it gave you this microscopic view or, or, or worldview of what the inside of your body looks like. <clears throat> so when we start, first of all, carbohydrates, there's really, they're all kinds of sugars, basically. They're, so it's, it's glucose, uh, fructose, galactose, lactose. Um, uh, there are different combinations of them. So glucose and fructose is what we call table sugar. And glucose is what's in our blood. So when we talk about blood sugar, it's glucose. Table sugars, glucose, and fructose, one to one. And fructose, we can only metabolize in our liver, and it produces toxic side effects, which we can talk about a bit later. But but that's one of the big problems. That's why I say the first thing to do, get sugar out of your diet, because half of that is fructose, and it's a toxic chemical, which we shouldn't be eating, which is funny when people talk about other things being chemicals. Like, well, they're all chemicals. So, <laughs> um, And uh, so if you talk about the, the basic sugars, the ones that taste sweet, we call those sugars. If they're connected together in big, long chains, we call them starches. So there's, you know, plants, we call it starch. In animals, we call it glycogen. But they're just a whole bunch of glucoses stuck together. And those can be broken up and, and released into your blood. And then there's fiber, which is, there's soluble and insoluble uh, fiber, um, which is also glucose, but it's connected together a little bit differently. So it doesn't, it's not used as an energy source metabolically. Um, and there's debate about whether, you know, you need fiber or not. You don't need it, but, but whether it's beneficial or not. And, 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 uh, uh, I personally think it, it is. So it's probably a good idea to get some fiber in your diet, especially soluble fiber. Um, and it, we can talk about what happens to that, but let's go back to the carbohydrate, uh, the sugars, you ingest it, you swallow it. Um, not much happens in the stomach, uh, but it, all these, uh, connections have to be broken down before they can be absorbed through the wall of the intestine and then absorbed into the blood. And if it's not glucose, it has to go to the liver to get converted into glucose. Um, and sometimes that creates toxic side effects like fructose. Um, so when you eat a lot of carbohydrate, you're going to have a lot of glucose going into the blood. Now, glucose in the blood is necessary. You know, you need to be between about uh, three to five milligrams per hundred mils. Um, it's a different measure in the States, you know, a hundred, what is it? Deciliters per liter or something like that. I, we have different ways of, um, of uh, calculating that, but the number in the States is a hundred, you know, here we're looking at three to five. Um, and, and, uh, at that level, it's, it's, it's normal. So your tissues will use it as needed. Um, and in particular your brain, because your brain cannot metabolize fatty acids cannot metabolize proteins, so it needs to metabolize glucose. So there's a lot of misinformation out there about the, the need to eat carbohydrate because your brain needs carbohydrate. But what they're forgetting is this process in your liver called gluconeogenesis, which literally means making new glucose. And your liver can make all the glucose it needs all the time naturally by using non-carbohydrate sources. Um, you know, you can use glycerol and, and amino acids and so on. So we don't need to ingest any carbohydrate. But when you do and you get all this glucose into your blood, you have to take it out because excess sugar in your blood is, is effectively toxic. It causes inflammation. Um, it will be stored. And when it's stored, it can be stored in, in fatty tissue because your muscles can only store so much as glycogen, not a huge amount. Your liver can store quite a bit more, but, but there's a limit to that. And then where does it go? It can't stay in the blood because it will cause damage. It will cause damage to tissues. Uh, it will cause chronic inflammation. And your body kind of knows that, speaking teleologically. So your body says, okay, we got to get it out. How does it get it out? Insulin. So your body releases insulin and that affects these certain receptors called GLUT receptors that allows the sugars in your blood to be drawn in mostly into your liver and your muscle cells. But again, if there's too much, some of it you can, you can pee out, you know, if there's too much, but, but there's a limit to that. And if you have chronically high levels, you're going to have problems. So, so that's what happens 
to the glucose and it when it's stored it goes back into these glycogen stores so your liver sticks them all back together until it's ready and then there's a hormone called glucagon which does the opposite of insulin breaks them apart again releases it into the blood so ideally you have a blood sugar level that's flat um and then the um soluble the fibers so you you know the starch is broken down into glucose so it's the same thing as sugar so when people say you know a potato or whatever a potato is sugar it's a big ball of sugar uh, it's just in a different form, but it is really a whole bunch of glucose. Um, rice is sugar. Pasta is sugar. They're all just sugars that are connected together, so we call them starch, but a rose by any other name, as Shakespeare said, right? So um, so the fiber is a bit different because of the way the bonds are connected together. The soluble fiber can actually be broken down and, and ingested, but it's broken down not in the gut, but not in the upper gut, but in the in the intestine by host bacteria. And it's actually absorbed as um, uh, short-chain fatty acids. So it's not absorbed as glucose, it's absorbed as fat into the blood. So uh, it does have some um, energetic benefit to the body. The, the uh, insoluble fiber is just bulk. And you know people argue that helps things pass through the system and absorb water and so on and so forth. So it's, it, I would view it as kind of benign. Um, and, uh, and then there, you know, there's other kind of, more complicated views of the different starch types, but I think we should leave that there, and then we can talk what happens after that. I'll let you respond, and then we'll talk about what happens at the cellular level. No, that's a great overview. And then where the problem happens, and you've alluded to this, when we're pushing through carbohydrates or sugar in the diet, we're either having too many at once acutely, or chronically, we're having a diet that's too high in those. And what this does is going to raise the blood sugar, again, either an acute spike or over time, it's going to keep elevating that blood sugar. And then insulin has to up its job. And I'll have you take it from there. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Let's, let's talk about what a standard American meal looks like. So what do most people, and I, I, Americans, Canadians are Americans too, right? It's North America. So what's the standard diet? You get up in breakfast, what do most people have? I would say cereal and milk or toast and peanut butter. Yep. Maybe a smoothie if, if they're a little bit more health conscious. Orange juice. Yeah. Okay. Juices, milk. So or orange juice is Coca-Cola with orange flavoring. It's loaded with sugar. How about yogurt? Yogurt, if it's not, it's loaded with sugar. Bread is sugar. Cereal was invented, and you can look this up to stop people from masturbating. <laughs> Kellogg again? Kellogg, he yeah. He comes up okay, on the so, show periodically. Okay, good. So people know that that's why cereal was invented. But, you know, my colleague, um, a highly esteemed colleague at the BC Cancer Research Center, where I, where we did our research on the breast cancer uh, study, uh, uh, Dr. Jerry Crystal, um, he just, when he hears cereal, he just goes, oh, that's horrible stuff. He's cereal. <laughs> but... What do they do? They give it to Howard Moscovich and he make, he puts salt on it, he puts sugar on it, and he makes it taste so good you can't stop eating those Honey Nut Cheerios or what they just taste great. And and then so the cereal companies go, yeah, but with milk, you know, this is a really health, well, it's the milk that's giving you <laughs> all the nutrients. So, um, yeah, so and then the orange juice is sugar, the 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 yogurt sugar, the the cereal is sugar, the the jam is sugar. Um, and you're putting sugar in your tea or coffee or whatever. So so you're loading up with sugar. What does your body do? Huge amounts of insulin are required in order, huge abnormally high amounts, which we call hyperinsulinemia. So that would be um, acute hyperinsulinemia. Too much insulin in your blood now to combat the fact that you have too much sugar in your blood. And insulin is a very beneficial, very, very powerful hormone that has multiple effects, one of which is to draw sugar out of the blood, one of which is to promote protein synthesis. But it also affects salt balance in the kidneys, which we can talk later about how ketogenic diets can help control hypertension. Um, and it also affects our brain hormone system, the leptin and the ghrelin, which are the kind of, ghrelin is the go, I'm hungry, and leptin is kind of the stop, you're full hormones that are released by your brain. So it's really powerful, but what it also does is bias the storage of glucose in your blood to either be burned in the muscles if the glucose levels are fairly low, but it's a very steep curve. As soon as the glucose levels get higher and the insulin levels get higher, uh, heavily biased towards storing as fat. So if you're eating that high sugar breakfast, you're basically telling your body, store fat like crazy, right? And so 
you, then you think, well, I'll go burn it off, right? And uh, we have a phrase in kinesiology, you cannot outrun your fork. Uh, a bad diet is not corrected by a lot of exercise. And uh, yes, you should go for, get some light exercise just to walk around the block after meals. It really helps with that insulin signaling to get it to burn the sugar that you've just eaten in your diet and not to store it. So, so as I say, after I, in fact, just before this, I had had uh, breakfast and I went out for a little walk for half an hour uh, just to get to that, that proper insulin signal um, to my body so that I wouldn't store any of the food I've had, any of the sugar that I might have ingested as, as, as fat. Um, and it burns it. So, you know, my triglyceride levels are super low all the time because I'm burning fat all the time. And my blood glucose levels, of course, are, are completely steady all the time because I'm not really consuming any carbohydrate to much degree, maybe, maybe 50 or so grams a day, something like that. Probably less most days and, and some days a little more. Uh, I've been known on my birthday to have a Guinness. <laughs> and you know, it's funny because, uh, when you work in labs, like the ones we have with all the very, very sophisticated equipment, you can kind of test your blood and see the effect of things. And for some reason, Guinness doesn't do much to my ketone levels. It doesn't knock me out of ketosis, even though it's got some carb in it. So my body's probably on part Celtic, so probably pre-adapted to drinking Guinness, I guess. But that's only on rare occasion. Um, so, so then you, then you're this high insulin levels repeat themselves after lunch because what do people eat for lunch soup with noodles sandwiches again maybe a soda which would be awful but or or the classic burger and fries and soda you know that's loaded with carbohydrate and sugar and all that sort even if it doesn't taste sweet there's lots of sugar in there too in the form of starch and then you have your dinner and of course you know, even chefs will say, well, what's the starch in there? You know, you have to have your pasta, rice, bread, potatoes, whatever. It has to be with every meal. Uh, it doesn't. But so what you're doing is you're elevating your levels of glucose abnormally high all day long, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And the result of that has to be excessive insulin in the blood. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And so then we have this chronic state of hyperinsulinemia. And what does that do? All kinds of bad things. So hyperinsulinemia or excessive insulin in the blood, it's, it's like anything. When balanced, it does wonderful things. If it's too low, you're going to be sick. You know, you have diabetes effectively. Um, if it's, if it's uh, too high, it's also going to cause problems like any other hormone. And so you're unnaturally elevating your levels of insulin in your blood on a standard American diet. The SAD, aptly named acronym, <laughs> the SAD diet is going to artificially elevate your glucose levels, therefore your insulin levels all day long. And hyperinsulinemia, name the disease. There's about 70% of chronic diseases are either the, the root cause or an aggravating uh, element is, uh, is hyperinsulinemia. So it's really bad for chronic disease, and we're doing this to ourselves day after day. And I think it's largely because we're told that's a healthy diet. So it's, uh, and, and then, so if you look at the cellular level, let's look at the difference. What if you just take that carbohydrate out and it's magical? It doesn't go to zero. So there's still sufficient glucose there for your brain to use and for your muscles to absorb. And, you know, you can still go out and do your athletic activities. There's some adaptation, but let's talk about that later. But if you take the carbohydrate out, well, your body goes, well, I still need energy. So there's all this fat. That's what fat's for. It's like, I view them as um, uh, glucose is kind of like kindling on a fire. You know, it burns quickly, burns bright, burns hot. Um, uh, fats are kind of like Presto logs. I guess that's a name brand, but they're kind of like, you know, good solid logs. You put them on the fire, they burn for a long time. They release heat gently. And, and uh, it's a much more efficient, effective, cleaner way to fuel your body. And, uh, and if you, if you do that, what you start seeing is all these symptoms and signs of chronic disease start to reverse themselves. And we see that again, I, I should say, first of all, I'm not a physician. Uh, secondly, um, so this isn't medical advice. This is just science, right? I'm just talking about the science. So you could view it as, as wellness advice or health advice, but, uh, ketogenic diets work for about seven out of eight people pretty effectively. The other eight, there are varying reasons why it might not. People are all metabolically different and things don't all work the same for everyone. Uh, and there are some uh, contraindications. So in my book, BioDiet, I think it's on around page 100. It's the first start of chapter two, which tells you how to do it. First thing you should do is talk to your physician. 
and see if you have any of these contraindications. Now, most of them are, you know, pretty rare genetic disorders that have to do with the metabolism of the ketones that are produced. And so you're very unlikely to have those. But there's some other, you know, liver and kidney conditions for which it might not be recommended. And uh, so I'm not a physician. I can't, you know, recommend to people from a medical perspective whether it's appropriate or not. And the other thing to consider is because some of these benefits, like better control of blood sugar, better control of blood pressure, if you're taking medications for those, so anti-hyperglycemic drugs or anti-hypertensive drugs, you need your physician to know so that they can provide a concomitant reduction of those medications as your conditions improve. And you know, for, for, for diabetics, which is a condition where you have excessive blood sugar, we've seen people that have been diabetic for decades, like more than 10 years, uh, and they go on a well-formulated ketogenic diet that's monitored, and we've seen people in four or five weeks, no medication needed whatsoever. It completely reverses the type 2 diabetes. Now, we're told, and I don't really care because my stakes are low, but we're told we can't call that a cure. So, Maybe we shouldn't because what we're asking people to do is, is eat a natural human diet and when they do, they get healthier. That should come as no surprise. But we're told that it, it has to be a reversal but not a cure because they have to continue the intervention in order for it to be maintained. And see the difference there? So, so, be, so, oh, and here's another good point about obesity. So, and this is a very simple rule from obesity research everywhere. If you become obese or overweight and you lose that weight, Whatever you've done to lose that weight, you now have to do for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, so pick carefully. Now, some people like exercising and do that. It helps them control their weight. That's great. But really, the most effective way is to change your diet, which, yes, means you're going to have to go through some significant lifestyle changes. And they may be cultural. You know, there's lots of cultural things about eating certain foods and so on. You, and you will need some discipline and you will need to plan a bit. But I... For seven out of eight people listening there, they're the ones in poor metabolic health, I can tell you what the science supports is that if you can adopt a well-formulated, physician-monitored ketogenic diet, you're very likely to reverse the poor metabolic health you're in and return yourself into good metabolic health, and it should happen within roughly 12 weeks for most people. That's incredible news. I want to come back to the part of the story when you're talking about blood sugar being elevated, causing the insulin to be released for people that are feeling like, okay, why is my body doing this to me? Why is it being so, you know, 180 working against me physiology wise? And I just want to highlight the fact that it really isn't. It's actually protecting you because if that blood glucose kept going up and up, that would cause all kinds of problems. The insulin needs to come in to regulate that, to protect you. And then it has nothing, it has nowhere to put all this extra glucose. So that's why it gets stored as fat. So your body's actually protecting you with this mechanism. And it only goes awry when we abuse our, our carbohydrate intake over time. Yeah, you couldn't have said it better. And actually, uh, who says that really well is uh, Peter Atia. Peter's got a new book out now, too. I haven't read it yet. but uh, And we don't agree on all things, Peter and I. Uh, we don't have discussions. I've never met him or talked to him. But um, but he is a very, very clever guy, and he does have a message to say. In one of his TED Talks, he talks about, you know, he's a physician being in there looking at a diabetic that needed some um, some limbs, you know, amputated because of their diabetes and why this was happening. And he was saying, well, you know, the obesity is your body's reaction to the excess carbohydrates trying to protect you from that excess sugar in your blood. And it has nowhere, it can't burn it. So it has, the only place it can go is fat. So you can think of obesity as your body's protective way of preventing excess sugar from causing the damage it does in the bloodstream. And if we then look at, well, not all diabetics are obese. I mean, there's a huge correlation there because I, again, I would argue it's the same disease. Cardiovascular disease is the same disease. Cancer is largely the same disease. Um, it's a metabolic issue. So, but there are, you know, we call them skinny diabetics, um, you know, skinny outside, fat inside, Sophie sometimes. So their outside of their body might be very lean and skinny, but inside they have a lot of fat around their organs and so on. And their outcomes are actually much worse than obese diabetics. They have shorter lifespans, bigger challenges managing their blood. Why, again, going back to what um, Peter Atia was kind of suggesting is, well, their bodies aren't very good at storing fat. 
So they're so because they can't, the blood sugar has nowhere to go except stay in the blood. And when it stays in the blood, it causes the damage that we associate with, you know, later stage unmanaged type two diabetes, which is you know loss of vision, loss of limbs. It's mostly circulatory issues, and uh, and 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 this is a result of the inflammation that excess sugar causes in in the blood. Systemic inflammation, we call it. Well, let's continue the story even further. So for somebody that continues to eat a high carb diet push that blood glucose up, continue to spike insulin over years, and the body over time needs to make more and more insulin to deal with that glucose. Talk about the problems that can accrue when when they get into that situation. Right. And this usually hits you 40s, 50s. You know, and remember, up until about 100 years ago, that's about how long you'd live anyway. So and, and then we start, we, we see obesity first, and then about 10 years later, we start seeing diabetes, and then you know, we start seeing heart disease and cancer and, and Alzheimer's, which is really a type of diabetes. If you listen to uh, Suzanne uh, Delamonte, I think, at Brown University, she calls it type 3 diabetes because um, it's an inflammation uh, caused by uh, uncontrolled glucose that affects the brain. Um, but if you look at that, so... I, you know, I, I have, uh, she's passed away now, but I had an aunt that was slowly going deaf, um, as happens to people when they're older. And you'd go into her apartment and the TV was on like so loud and, and you could see the button where the volume up was and it was just like dented in. She's just trying to get the volume louder. And so the reason I'm telling you this story is to provide an analogy for what happens when you have too much of something all the time in your system. So what's happening to her, she's going deaf. So what do you do? You turn the sound up so you can hear it. But loud sounds makes you go deaf. So then she gets more deaf. So she turns the volume up more. And then she gets more deaf and eventually she can't hear anything. So think of that now in terms of the cells. So individual cells that need glucose have glucose transporters. And there's different types of them. They're GLUT, glut transporters, um, uh, so that the sugars can be differentially absorbed into, say, muscle cells or brain cells or whatnot. And so... As we, um, as we provide insulin, the insulin binds to receptors and that opens these channels that allow the glucose to come in. It can't just diffuse in naturally, it has to go through channels. It's, it's too big and too ionically charged. Um, so, uh, so the insulin has receptors that open channels. Now, if you have too much insulin, your, cell, you know, your cells are not static. They don't just build them once and they're there like your house. They're building them, taking them apart, building them, taking them apart. And that's so that your cells can respond in more or less, you know, as needed on a, on a moment by moment basis to what the needs are for the body. So if it needs more sugar, more receptors for insulin, you know, more insulin effect, more sugar comes in and it can do that quite rapidly. Um, so that's what it's doing, dynamically producing these receptors. Now, what happens is if you have too much of a signal all the time, think about that. What if you had too much insulin in your body? Well, you'd suck too much sugar out of your blood. Why? How can you tell if that's happening? I'll tell you, at about 10 o'clock in the morning after that high sugar breakfast, you're going, wow, am I ever hungry? I need a muffin, right? Because your brain is going, we need some more sugar. Because we've released, you ate all the sugar, the insulin we released has a longer effect than it takes to absorb that sugar. So it stays in your system, absorbs too much sugar into the cells, mostly into fat cells. Now your blood sugar is too low, you're hyperglycemic, which is a huge signal to your brain to release ghrelin to say, I'm starving, I got to eat something. And what do you want to eat? Kindling. <laughs> you know, you want to eat kindling. You want to have a muffin or a chocolate bar, whatever it is. And that's what people eat. And they go into a coffee shop anywhere and it's full of high glycemic index carbs, which means can be easily absorbed, right? So, so then you've got too much insulin. So the cells respond by, whoa, 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 we've got too much glucose in here. We don't need this many receptors for insulin. If we reduce the number of insulin receptors then we won't be as responsive to this excessive insulin system uh, signal out there and we'll absorb the appropriate amount of glucose. So we call this downregulation. In other words, the number of receptors for insulin on the cells that need glucose are actually reduced in this process because the signal is too loud. So it's kind of like putting earmuffs on when the sound's too loud so that you don't go deaf, right? Uh, and then at, over time, what happens is uh, you reduce that so much that it becomes kind of stabilized within the cells, and they're now not responding to the glucose signal as they should. So now the body is going, okay, 
I'm releasing the appropriate amount of glucose, but the blood sugar levels are too high. So what should I do? I'll release more glucose because if I do, oh, sorry, excuse me, glucose insulin. I'll release more insulin. I can see you correcting me there. <laughs> What's he talking about? I'll release more insulin. So then we'll have that signal. I'll turn the TV up louder so I can hear it, right? I'll release more insulin so that the cells can now respond and absorb the appropriate amount of glucose. And, and, and so we call this a positive feedback effect, and those are never work out well, um, uh, with the exception of ovulation, I guess, which is a positive feedback effect, where th things explode or, or fail in positive feedback effects. So in ovulation, the ovule is released, you know, from, uh, from the ovary. So, but in your body, uh, positive feedback effects uh, generally end up causing damage. Another one is hypertension. You have high blood pressure. What do your blood vessels do? Well, they tighten to prevent that high blood pressure from popping the vessels. As they tighten, they stiffen, and then you have the same flow going through stiffer vessels, so you need more pressure, and that makes them stiffer, and you need more pressure, and that makes them stiffer, and so you end up with hypertension, which is why it's so important to control hypertension early before it causes too much stiffening of the arteries. Um, so the same thing happens. You become insulin resistant, and so then you go to your physician. So you're now insulin resistant. You're now probably 50. And your blood sugar is not being able to be controlled. doesn't matter how much insulin you produce. It's not absorbing it. Your blood sugar levels are rising above like seven. That's where they start clinically um, intervening. And, uh, and so they go, okay, your blood sugar level is too high, you know, and they do a two hour test or glucose tolerance test, GTT, they call it. Um, or you can get a hemoglobin A1C, which tells you the average amount of hemoglobin in, uh, of sugar in your blood because it attaches to the hemoglobin molecules and they're in red blood cells and they live about four months. So that's why it's hemoglobin A1C because they're looking at how much sugar is on the hemoglobin and that will be proportional to how much sugar is in your blood long term. So all those things will tell them that. And they'll say your blood sugar is too high, you're, you're pre-diabetic or you're diabetic. And your diabetic, this is type two. Type one is you can't produce insulin because the, cell, the beta cells and the pancreas have died. Type two is you're insulin resistant. And that's going to lead to all kinds of these chronic diseases we talked about. So here's where, now, my, one of my other hats is a design thinker. Design thing innovation is one of my big deals. And design thing innovation looks at root cause analysis. So you go to your physician, you now are insulin resistant because you've been eating this high carb diet for decades, and your blood sugar is now uncontrolled. And so your physician says, we have all these amazing drugs that will control that blood sugar. You know, metformin's been around for ages, but the other one obviously is insulin. So usually they try and control it with something that's not insulin for a while, but they're not treating the root cause of the disease. They're treating a symptom of the disease, which is high blood sugar. So unfortunately, our medical system is a bit delinquent here in that they're saying, as long as we lower your blood sugar down to a normal level, that excess of blood sugar won't have the harmful effects of the inflammation and so on. But you're not treating the root cause. You're simply managing a number, right? And as you manage that number, the disease progresses because the disease is a poor metabolic, it's your metabolic ill health and you're not addressing that. You're just addressing purely just the effect of that, which is the blood sugar level. And so it gets worse. So what happens? Well, okay, metformin, we'll add insulin to that because if we add some insulin, that'll boost the effect and then more insulin and then more insulin. And, you know, sadly for people that are diabetic, uh, they're simply managing a disease that they know is going to shorten people's lives and it's not going to end well. They'll get comorbidities. They'll have to probably have amputations of limbs or, you know, digits or whatever, uh, often go blind um, and have other the comorbidities like cancer. Usually cardiovascular disease is another one. Alzheimer's is very, very uh, much more prominent in diabetics and so on because they're all related to metabolic poor health. So this is so important. I'm glad we're hashing this out. I want to jump in for a quick second here. So what you're saying, in essence, the body is managing blood glucose over years by making more and more insulin. When that eventually breaks and the body can't keep up with the, the amount of insulin it's making, somebody goes to the doctor. Over time, they might get prescribed insulin, add more to the fire, and continue to have all the problems associated with insulin resistance. And now they're also facilitating growth, adding more body fat onto the body because insulin is a storage molecule. So from any angle you look at this, it's just a total mess. 
And then you go to the diabetes associations, <laughs> which are which I have to say are now coming around. They're now, you know, they're now hearing what we're saying. So up until recently, the recommendations for someone who's diabetic is a low fat, high carb diet. Right. So they're not saying that because they're understanding the the insulin hormonal mechanism, carbohydrate insulin mechanism of obesity. They're saying that because they believe that a low-fat, high-carb diet is the best to lose weight. So they're prescribing the wrong thing for the right reason. Ironically, when we take, and we have done this with thousands of clinical patients now, um, uh, Verta Healthcare, it's a for-profit company that works with diabetics that have had amazing success and done some tremendous research. I know they're for-profit, but I also know the people that are doing the research. They're excellent, excellent very ethical researchers, um, and they're paid to do their research, uh, as anybody else would be. Uh, and they have some amazing results that go out now five years to show the effects of well-formulated ketogenic diets and, and, and low-carb diets on, on diabetics. And it turns out, if physicians said, you know what, you should go on a ketogenic diet, you'd have a completely different outcome. Because now you're taking out the problem of the root cause, the excess of carbohydrate. You take out the excess of carbohydrate in the diet, the insulin levels modulate. The insulin sensitivity goes up. And we measure this called HOMA IR, home homeostatic mechanism for insulin resistance. Fairly easy to measure. So we can measure that. So the insulin resistance reverses itself. The diabetes effectively reverses itself. You can now control your blood sugar. You now don't need insulin. You now don't need metformin. Now, not everybody has that same success. The success rate for reducing medication is about 90%. The overall reversal of type 2 diabetes is in the 60 to 65% range. So for about two out of three people, uh, a well-formulated ketogenic diet is an effective cure, and it will also help you lose body fat, and it will have all these other benefits that come from the, the ketones that are produced uh, as well. So um, you know, I have this model that I talk about in the book that I call the axis of illness. And, you know, I've talked about the fact all these diseases are the same to me. Um, they're all metabolic. So there's so if you look at a triangle as an axis, right, let's put insulin resistance right at the top. Insulin resistance is a causal factor of, of hypertension. It's an aggravating factor in cancer. It causes uh, cardiovascular disease. It's an aggravating factor in Alzheimer's disease. It's basically, you know, about 70% of all chronic disease relates to insulin resistance. On the other, down here on the triangle, uh, we're going to put obesity, which is a disease in and of itself, because obesity uh, is uh, something that uh, once it starts, it tends to be self-promoting, and it also aggravates insulin resistance, and it aggravates the third part. All these things make each other worse. The third part of the triangle, which is inflammation. And so... Um, Alzheimer's is an inflammatory disease, as I mentioned. Cardiovascular disease is not due to excess carbohydrate, oh, sorry, not due to excess uh, um, cholesterol in your diet. Uh, it's not due to high LDL cholesterol independently. Um, there are some other factors that are better to measure. It's due to inflammation of the blood vessels. And how does that happen? Smoking can cause it, so you shouldn't smoke. High sugar levels in your blood causes systemic inflammation, so long-term systemic inflammation. So again, and the worst culprit is sugar because the fructose in the sugar aggravates that high levels of um, inflammation. It's pro-inflammatory, in other words. It also promotes more uh, fat deposition. It promotes more insulin resistance. So if you have your insulin resistance, your inflammation, and your obesity... It's a triangle, which I call the axis of illness. You remember like George Bush one's axis of evil, right? Uh, so this is the axis of evil for your body, those three things. And they make each other worse. So it doesn't really matter. Whatever starts, whatever causes what, they all make each other worse. And it just kind of spins around until it manifests itself as the first chronic disease, the second chronic disease, the third, which is why they're all related. Now, the good news is, really good news, is you take carbohydrate out of that model and we know it's really effective at reducing obesity. We know it's really effective at reducing insulin resistance. And we know it's really effective as an anti-inflammatory diet. So you're now hitting it at all three aspects of that axis of illness. And you're reducing all of their impacts. And so you see these really rapid improvements in overall metabolic health, again, within a few months. 
And that's the, I guess our bodies are resilient. So what we're kind of doing with this high carb, high glycemic index, high sugar diet is we're just beating our metabolism down until we get sick. But what I'm telling you today, what the science says is just stop beating it down. Just take that carbohydrate, keep, take that sugar out of your diet, get over the fact that, you know, you can't have dessert three times a day and just start eating other things which have more flavor or better for you anyway. And you'll see your health improve, improve dramatically. And it's almost like I guarantee, but really two out of three people see this really dramatic change. For other people, it might happen more slowly. And for some people, it might not work at all. Um, and you do need physician oversight because of some of the uh, needs for concomitant reduction of medication. And also in the adaptation phase, you can get some you know dizziness and lightheadedness, most of which can be managed with uh, getting salt balance right. Um, but that's all part of what, what I describe in the book. So the first half is kind of what we've talked about, why you should adopt a well-formulated ketogenic diet. The second half is kind of a five-step program, and there's lots out there that are equally as good, but um, I would say mine's based on the most recent science and and my own personal experience working with people. So um, One piece I want to highlight with the insulin resistance, we know this is a big part of the whole thing. You mentioned, I think it was 70% of chronic disease has its root in that. So if we're going to address something, again, the diet, you mentioned the diet piece being something that can hit all three of those pieces of the access. But what I'm getting at here is part of the scary thing about insulin resistance is that somebody can go on for years, and we, we touched on this, but I want to highlight the fact that people can go for 10 years, their body compensating, making more and more insulin to help regulate the blood glucose, and they're causing all kinds of all kinds of damage in the body, not knowing it. When they finally get to the point, they're going to see the doctor. They've been causing likely damage for years and years. Yeah. And, you know, I feel bad for the physicians. I mean, uh, physicians in increasingly are coming on. There's a, um, there's a group in Canada who are both Canadian. There's a group in Canada called the Canadian Clinicians for Therapeutic Nutrition. I'm actually on their scientific advisory board. Uh, there's about, I think we're approaching 10,000 members now of physicians that realize that they've got things wrong and that you can do a lot uh, without having to prescribe drugs to help people um, that have these chronic diseases. And, and they're starting to realize that, you know, rather than go through the typical medical model decision tree uh, for treatments and for, uh, for um, drug treatments, that they might want to start with lifestyle. And so, but they're not trained. You know, the average in North America medical schools for nutrition training is less than three hours. So you have basically one class. And, um, you know, nutrition is really complicated. It's like, so my, even my introductory students, I go, this is not like cooking classes or recipes. This is metabolism and biochemistry. So it's, unless you're really strong in those areas, it's going to be difficult to understand. So that's why I love when people that don't have that training talk about nutrition, like they understand what's going on. And I'm sort of going, I, I don't know where to start with you. Cause do you know, you know, do you know what a carbohydrate is? Cause a lot of people go, I have a friend who just said, well, what about potatoes? And I go, well, of course they're full of carbohydrates. And he goes, well, to me, they're just potatoes. So, I mean, that's, and that is a smart guy. He's a lawyer, right? So he's a smart, intelligent, well-read guy, but he has no idea that potatoes have carbohydrate. In them. That's the level of the general public. So Again, that's why, you know, I felt it was, I was obliged to write a book to tell people actually how nutrition works, what the nutrients are that you need, how you get them and, and what a healthy diet really consists of from my perspective. Um, and, and, uh, yeah. And I think the, the medical community, you know, from, from lab science to clinical practice is usually about 17 years before they start. So, you know, thank God we have organizations like the Canadian Clinicians for Therapeutic Nutrition and there's similar organizations uh, in the U.S., there's uh, the Nutrition Coalition is another good one for for real science based information in the U.S. Um, uh, that's Nina Teicholz. She started that, and then um, you know she wrote the um, what was the name of her book? Now it was about fat, big fat, big fat. No, it wasn't big, big fat, fat live. Something. Yeah, sorry, Nina. <laughs> we'll put it in the show notes. I've interviewed good. her, but it's been years, so. Yeah, and she's wonderful. I mean, she's a she's a journalist primarily, um, uh, and so is Gary Tobbs. But I mean, those two journalists have done more to promote the science of uh, the new science of nutrition that needs to be promoted out there. And and I'm thankful to both of them for for doing that. So because we're just you know we're just sitting there in the lab trying to do the science as best we can, and uh, and then we need people like that to help get the information out. But at, at this point in in um, uh, in my career, I just thought I was obliged to 
try and help. You know, I'm a communicator, I'm a teacher, so I you learn things and you teach them, right? So I'm trying to trying to help the public understand. So I wanted to say to you, Jesse, I you know I've listened to a number of your episodes. I think you have 540 odd episodes. <laughs> I didn't listen to all of them, but this is a great show, very highly produced, and I really um, want to thank you for doing this. Uh, for having a show that brings people on to talk about their models for optimal health or for ultimate health. Uh, it's really important. And um, anything I can do, you know, to help you, even if I disagree with the other people that you have on, that's what you're supposed to do in science is disagree, find out what the points are, and then go and investigate those and see where the truth lies, right? Not just have headbutting arguments in, you know, political arenas or something like that. It's just, that just doesn't get us anywhere. You know, I was, I was speaking once and somebody asked, you know, what should we do to try and change public policy? And I said, well, don't write your congressperson. That's not going to help because they have so many competing interests and they're just going to look at their, you know, voting record or whatever, how, or chance of reelection and how that, forget about them. What you need to do is use the resource we have and social media is a powerful resource if used properly. So using programs like your podcast and your vodcast to get accurate information out to people. And, and just looking through your, your list of the people you've had on, you know, I know many of them, well, I know some of them, I, you've had so many on, uh, some of them I met personally and I know, and they're aware of my research and vice versa. And some of them I just know by reputation, but you've really curated a great group of people to have on. And so I would say anybody can tune into any of your episodes and, and learn a lot. And, and I look forward to doing that myself too. Well, thank you for all that. Often I learn stuff. I'll hear stuff from like one of your other guests, um, you know, like Cynthia Thurlow, for example, she was just on recently and Cynthia and I were speaking together in uh, Salt Lake City a while back. And I'll hear her say something, go, huh, I never knew that. Or I wonder if that's right or whatever. I'll kind of look at it. And, you know, if I wonder by, I might send her an email and chat with her about it. And I'm, science is never done. It's always a work in process. So we have what we call a paradigm shift happening in nutrition science, where we have an old model that's bet, broken and make people sick. We're trying to get people to adopt this new model, especially politicians, but that information has to come from the public. So the good news is, you know, 12 to 18 percent of the United States um, uh, consumers uh, claim to be ketogenic. I don't know if they are or not. I don't know what they're eating. I'm not measuring their ketones, but 12 to 18 percent, you know, that's like roughly one in eight people at least. Uh, has heard the news. And that will begin to, gr it's growing tremendously already. It's doubled or tripled in the last few years. So because it works, people are realizing, first of all, it was, yeah, you can lose weight. But unfortunately, now we have these drugs, the semaglutide drugs, you know, like Gozempic and Wagovi. Uh, people want a drug, it's easier, what, I don't know, an injectable drug rather than change your diet? Not for me, but, uh, but it does. It's the best diet for losing and maintaining and managing your weight. But there's also this whole group of people that are diabetic and have other issues that are adopting ketogenic diets that are finding, wow, this has been a virtual cure for me. I thought I was going to die and, and it was going to be a slow managed, uncomfortable death. And now I realize I have my life back. I can live a full life and I don't have to be diabetic. So it's pretty important to get that out. For sure. And I think at this point, it's important that the two of us get really practical for people that have been tuning into this point. We've made it obvious some of the big culprits that people want to be on the lookout and avoid things like processed foods, sugar, carbohydrates, which are basically a synonym for sugar. But for somebody who wants to take on what we're talking about here and adopt a ketogenic diet, how do they start? First thing is to talk to your physician, right? Talk to your uh, GP uh, and, uh, and let them know this is what you plan to do and why. And, and uh, if they're not supportive, honestly, find another GP. Because if they don't know by now, they should. Um, that might not always be an easy thing to do, but it's sort of, and it's a hard statement to make. But yeah, find a new GP if they don't, if they're not willing to support you in this, because there are things that should be measured and monitored and so on. Um, and then, uh, you know, in terms of the practical steps you take, I'd say the first thing is to, is to make sure you're well hydrated, drink lots of water, and just like try and get sugar out of your diet. Sugar's the biggest culprit to me, like sucrose, table sugar, get that out of your diet. Um, and you don't need it. And there are some good, you know, alternative sweeteners. I don't like artificial sweeteners, you know, like aspartame or sucralose. They're all basically poisons of one form or another. But there are alternate sweeteners there that are that are natural that 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 are good. 
Um, and, and you don't need a lot of it because as you adapt to a ketogenic diet, you kind of lose your sweet tooth. You don't need it so much. You start craving things like grass fed butter and you want to eat it like cheese, you know, it's, <laughs> and you can, that's the wonderful thing. Um, so yeah, get, so in terms of the carbohydrates, the high glycemic stuff out next. So the sugar out first, then the like bread, you know, bagels, uh, rice, pasta stuff. Because that's pretty high glycemic, and it means it's easily absorbed, which means it really helps your blood sugar rise rapidly, which causes a big insulin bolus to be released. Um, and uh, for sure, processed foods, because and by the way, processed foods that are any, anything in a package is probably not very good for you. Uh, and if it's in a package and it says Nutra or healthy, it's probably not. Sorry, but it's probably not because they can make those claims without really because it's food it's not a drug so they can kind of make those claims without having any evidence for it so ignore that um just look on the label and look at the carbohydrates and if it's got a lot of carbohydrates or a whole bunch of you know stuff in it that you don't you can't even pronounce uh or you know any trans fats i think those are pretty much out of the food system now don't eat that stuff um and then the other one would be seed oils um and uh uh seed oils are so you we have uh, saturated fats, which there's plant saturated fats, like you get an avocado and so on, which are good. Um, saturated fats are solids at room temperature. So butter, you know, animal fat, that sort of thing are saturated fats. They're totally fine on a ketogenic diet because they only exacerbate problems if you already have a high glyce glycemic uh, load in your, in sorry, a high glucose load in your bloodstream. Um, in the absence of that, which on a ketogenic diet, it's, it's low. Uh, you can have all the saturated fat you want. So, for instance, they, I've been sipping on my my tea here, which is with full fat whipping cream. Like that's, I try and get fat wherever I can and saturated fat's fine. If people aren't good with dairy, it's often the lactose and there isn't any lactose in full fat cream anyway. So they're probably going to be okay, but, you know, go with that gently. Um, and, uh, uh, but the seed oils now, there's sort of nut oils, which are things like, you know, avocado oil is kind of a nut and uh, olive oil. Uh, those are all good. Um, coconut oil is another nut oil, which is high in saturated fat is good. Uh, what you don't want, especially is the cheap stuff that they do processed food in, like linseed oil, cotton oil, um, even canola. You know, sorry for our Canadian farmers there, but canola, which is rapeseed, is not. It's And the reason is they're, they're highly inflammatory. So they, so the monounsaturated fats like olive oil are, are very good. They're very beneficial. The omega-3 fats like you get in fish oils and, and uh, grass-fed butter, that's why I said grass-fed is high in omega-3, really, really good, really beneficial. We've done our own clinical work at the Cancer Research Center to show the benefits for reducing incidence of cancer in mice, albeit, uh, with omega-3s. Um, uh, but those seed oils are, are highly, they have a lot of omega-6, 9, and they're highly inflammatory, So and they're cheap. That's why... And corn oil is another crappy one. So so no corn oil, canola oil, you know, sunflower oil, none of that sort of stuff. Just stick with good old lard is great. Tallow is great. You know, they used to make McDonald's French fries in tallow. And uh, I, this is a long time ago. They're amazing. And there's one sort of zealot billionaire in Colorado that decided that he was going to save the world by getting uh, beef tallow out of um, out of McDonald's. So he basically drove them to using crappy seed oils that they do now. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen a McDonald's French fry, but you can, you can have one of those things behind your couch for like three years and it'll still be fine. That tells me something's not right. It should have decomposed, right? <laughs> I've seen so, that with the burgers too. Yeah, it's yeah, scary. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, and the burger, you know what? A burger's fine as long as you don't, you know, it depends what oil they use, but as long as you don't eat the bun and you don't eat the fries, you know, the burger and the lettuce and the... Tomato and the bacon and the cheese, that's all wonderful stuff. So as long as you don't as long as you don't have the carbs, it's all good. The other oil you advocate for, I want to bring this up, is the MCT oil, specifically the C8, especially for people that are adopting this diet in the beginning and transitioning. So talk about how that fat is different and why it's good. Yeah, no, it's a good it's a good segue actually talking about ketones, because we talk about this ketogenic, which means you're making ketones. <clears throat> so let's start there and Essentially, when you switch from burning sugar on a high carb diet to burning fat on a high fat diet, uh, no surprise, you start losing fat because you're burning the fat that you're eating, but you're also burning the fat that you've stored. So you lose weight, but you're losing mostly body fat, which is great. That's what people want, right? 
But when you metabolize that, um, you produce a byproduct called a, a ketone. And there's actually three. The, the, the true ketone that's produced is called acetone, which is like nail polish remover, right? But the one that's produced first in this process is called acetoacetate. And acetoacetate is, um, uh, uh, is not, it's actually a ketone body. It's not a true ketone. And this is just to do with the way we name things in biochemistry, but we'll call it a ketone. And then that either forms into acetone, which is true ketone, or the really beneficial, most of it gets turned into this really beneficial molecule called beta hydroxybutyrate, which is a derivative of butyric acid, butter, butyric acid, same idea, right? It's a just a little small carbon thing. Now, this um, ketone, hyd uh, well, um, uh, hydroxy um, um, uh, butyric acid, uh, is or is is like a super molecule. It's a signaling molecule, so it, it works like a hormone. It's an energetic molecule in that it can be burned in cells for energy, um, and it also changes our um, our metabolic systems to promote more fat um, fat burning as opposed to sugar burning. So beta hydroxybutyrate um, or you know BHB, we can call it BHB if you want to shorten the name for folks. Um, interestingly, we thought, and probably many people think, uh, well, your brain can only use glucose. That's why you have to eat glucose. Not true. And since the 60s, we've known that the brain actually not only uses beta hydroxybutyrate, but prefers beta hydroxybutyrate. And it can get into the brain cells. It doesn't need a pump like the glucose does. It, it does need a receptor, which ironically is also called an MCT receptor, but it's not the same thing as the medium chain high Just That's an abbreviation for that. Goes down its concentration gradient. It flows right into brain cells where it's preferred to glucose. And it has less oxidative stress and therefore less inflammation. Before we move forward, just so to clarify, because I've gotten yeah. confused on this in the past. Yes, the brain prefers BHB, but it still burns glucose at the same time if I'm correct. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it'll, I mean, the brain the, the brain is really active. Like right now, we're not very active. Our brain is not much. It's a you know pound and a half of fat that's uh, consuming about 20% of our uh, energy. So it's a really energy hungry system. <clears throat> they can't use fats and can't use proteins. So, so that's one of the reasons our bodies are so sensitive to maintaining a base level of glucose. But, but you can replace that basically one for one with beta hydroxybutyrate. And uh, I know uh, Dom Diagostino has been on your show before. And Dom is actually, I don't know how he got the ethical review, but he did it to himself. He basically, he's like super ketogenic. He basically got his ketone levels up and brought his insulin level down almost to zero. Oh, sorry, his, his blood sugar level down almost to zero. Now, any of us, when it drops below about three, would start getting kind of dizzy and cranky. And at two, we'd probably start passing out and we'd go into a coma and die. But he got it, I think he got it down below one. And he was totally awake and alert because he had a high ketone level. So it trades off. And in your brain, it can burn both, but it will selectively burn the beta hydroxybutyrate preferably. And, and, and the benefit there is you have uh, um, an, an energy source that takes less oxygen to burn and creates less oxidative stress in the tissues. And remember, uh, Alzheimer's is an inflammatory disease. So uh, as a little aside, my, my, my friend and colleague Stephen Kunane at University of Sherbrooke has been studying using MCT oil. So this is medium chain triglyceride oil. We'll go back to that in a minute. But what that does when you ingest it, it goes directly to your liver and, and it's turned 100% into beta hydroxybutyrate. So it's basically getting ketone into your system. And with his Alzheimer's patients, he's shown that just two tablespoons a day significantly improves their cognitive function, all other things being controlled. So what we're seeing is a real response of the brain to uh, the presence of the ketones as a preferred fuel, improving its function. I wouldn't say a cure or, you know, make it, it just makes things better though, which of course, you know, when you're losing cognitive function is important. Question for you before we move forward then, just to make sure I'm clear on that. So when somebody is in nutritional ketosis through diet alone or having something like an MCT oil, they have ketones in the body. The brain prefers those. When the brain is burning those, is glucose still part of that picture and fuel source? 
or is do the ketones fully replace that? Uh, they well, they they it's you know the Krebs cycle thing. They work into different aspects of the Krebs cycle. So one doesn't interfere with the other. It's just that your brain cells will prefer one to the other based on how easy it can get in. It's ready supply. I mean, think of it as a uh, you know it's a big complicated uh, colossal city, and you're just grabbing whatever's you know you see a whole bunch of options. You grab whatever you think is best first. So they're both part of the energy production. Yeah, you don't shut off glucose metabolism by uh, by increasing your uh, beta hydroxybutyrate, but your brain your brain can you know in the, some of the we can't do these studies anymore these starvation studies with people <laughs> did them in the sixties sorry uh, but um, uh, they, yeah you can you can actually get your ketone levels up where they represent about eighty percent of the total um, metabolism of the brain which is which is pretty pretty cool um, so so that's you know, one aspect of that. So the MCT is mediated chain triglyceride. This is a coconut oil derivative for the most part. And the C you were talking about, C8, so it's how many carbons are in that chain for that triglyceride. So medium chain means they're not really short, like two or three or four. They're not super long, they're medium. So usually like a dozen or so. So there's C6, 8, 10, and 12. Uh, and I should remember what they're all called uh, because I teach this stuff, but it escapes me at the moment. I probably need some ketones in my brain to freshen it up. Um, but the C8 would actually be the best, but nobody can tolerate that stuff. You give people a teaspoonful of it, they'll throw it right back up. It's just, it's just you cannot tolerate it. Uh, C8 is completely odor-free and taste-free, and 100% of it converts into, um, into beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, and, you know, you talk to Dave Asprey, I think he's got some good products out there that are, that are pure. I've talked to Dave and they, they are pure C8. He didn't have it on his label. I said, well, you should put that on your label. And he, he does now. I don't know if because of me, but it's great. Um, then there's C10, which is pretty good. It's a pretty good anti-inflammatory. Um, some of it converts into beta hydroxybutyrate, but, um, and then there's C12, which ha has almost none of it converts into beta hydroxybutyrate. And so there's these cheaper MCT oils that are mixes because they're less expensive, but the more purified forms, uh, you know, you should start with maybe a teaspoon a day because for, I don't know, one in three people or so, they'll get some like digestive urgency, we'll call it, um, almost immediately. So you have to decide whether that's you. You'll you'll adapt to that pretty quickly, but start with a teaspoon a day. And then, you know, if you work up to a tablespoon a day, I think that's a good thing when you're starting to adopt a ketogenic diet because most of these I mean, you, you produce ketones every night, but most of these pathways have not been exercised as much as they should have been. When I say pathways, I mean, you know, metabolic pathways in your cells. And so by introducing the ketones to it, you're telling your body, yeah, this is going to be a pretty regular part of our energy supply. So start upregulating those uh, systems that can use um, beta-hydroxybutyrate as a fuel. And, uh, you know, we're talking about the axis of illness and how people know. So it uh, relates back to, to, to Dr. Cunane's work. So if you're obese, you know, that's one of the, so it's obesity, inflammation, insulin resistance. If you're obese, take your clothes off, turn sideways, look in a mirror, right? You're going to know if you're obese or not. There's all these BMIs and all that sort of stuff. If your waist, you know, you're a man, it's over 40 inches, you, you know, you're probably overweight or obese. You know, and a woman cut it back to about 34 inches, but there's simpler measures that work. I talk about some of them in, in, in the book too. Um, but you can pretty much tell if you're obese or not. Um, how do you tell if you're inflamed? Well, you hurt. So you'll you'll see people that are aging saying, oh, I hurt all the time. Everything hurts all the time. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, part of it is your tissues are drying up a little bit. They're not as flexible. So you need exercise. You know, you need hydration a lot. Part of it is that you're chronically inflamed because of a high carb diet. So what you'll find as you adapt a well-formulated ketogenic diet is that chronic pain goes away. And I had uh, one of my colleagues in person, I was counseling, come in and say, this is amazing. Like I ride my bike all the time. I don't hurt anymore after I ride my bike. Like this is just amazing. And and interestingly too, um, I was just in Australia for a bit and and I, I kind of, people said, oh, you got to try these, you got to try these croissants. These croissants are good. I don't eat croissants. You know, they're, they're, try one, try one. So I ate one. It was fine. It tastes great and all that. But man, I hurt the next day. Like my body's really sensitive to carbohydrate. And I, I was thinking, why do I hurt? Am I getting sick? No, I was like, that was chronic inflammation, just like, whoa, carbs. <laughs> mm. We're not used to that. 
Um, how do you tell if you're insulin resistant? That's really tough unless you're doing a blood test. And there are, you know, glucose tests you can do with urine strips and blood tests and stuff. But I think one of the ways to tell uh, that relates to Kunain, Dr. Kunain's work is uh, brain fog. So you'll hear people, and I work a lot with postmenopausal women, and they'll they'll complain of brain fog. And once they adapt to a ketogenic diet, when all these pathways switch on that allow them to burn ketones in their brain uh, in appreciable amounts, some of them have like a, a sudden awakening. They literally wake up one day and they go, oh my God, what just happened? And I, and I had another woman come into my office one day and she said, what did you do? And I go like, I don't know what's going on. She said, it's like you pulled cotton wool out of my brain that's been there for 10 years. So I have never thought, I'm like I can do, I'm just thinking so clearly. I don't have that foggy morning stuff anymore. So, you know, my name's Harper. So my my um, friends often call it the Harper High, right? You get the Harper High from the adaptation. Not everybody experiences that. I did actually when, you know, a dozen years or so when I, when I uh, adapted to a ketogenic diet, I woke up one day and I thought, well, I haven't felt this fantastic in, in years. It may be the reduction of inflammation and other things, but, but it's kind of cool. And, it, and it's your body's way of saying, whatever you're doing, keep doing that. <laughs> that was great. It's almost like, you know, crack cocaine or whatever, but in a good way. It's like, oh, wow, that was so good. Let's keep doing that. And so it gives you that, that incentive to keep doing it. You're losing weight. You're feeling better. People are saying... Um, uh, wow, you've lost weight. You look great. What's happening? Your skin clears up. You know, all these amazing things happening that are due to, to chronic inflammation and, and due to insulin resistance. By the way, acne is due to insulin resistance. Uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is the leading cause of infertility in women, due to insulin resistance. So even younger people that are becoming insulin resistant will have these other symptoms. But the main one for most older people is brain fog. So that can clear up pretty quickly. And that's, and that's pretty cool. And so the C8 will help with that. You, you, some people find, in fact, you know, there's stockbrokers and stuff that pretty high energy, high, high thinking people that are using C8, you know, for, uh, for those purposes. I'm told that there are, you know, you never know what they're eating, but the, um, you know, most of the Tour de France, we're just about to go into that next month. Most of the Tour de France, they're all keto adapted now. And, and it's because the, when you're burning fats and ketones, you need a lot less oxygen to produce the same energy. And really, aerobic events are how fast can you get oxygen to your cells and how much do you need? So if you now switch to fat burning uh, and you can get the same output with less oxygen, then you're going to have an advantage over a year. I think Chris Froome was the first guy. You know, he was like a nobody and all of a sudden he won four years in a row. And what did he do? Well, if you ask the folks at Cambridge that were helping him out, they were uh, they were actually producing ketones that not not just C eight but actual ketone ketone esters that they're putting as water bottle and stuff. So he was just like ketoned up. <laughs> it's not very pleasant tasting the ketone esters. There's there's also ketone salts that are in a lot of products, but you get a lot better better benefit from the from the diet than you would doing the salts. But if you want to get ketones into your system and get it sensitized for adaptation, uh, MCT oil is the way to go. You mentioned that Harper High, and it sounds like that's something people experience the way you explained it as they're transitioning to a diet like this. For somebody like you that's been doing it for years, producing ketones, having that as a fuel source for the brain on a regular basis, are you just in that that phase all the time? Or are you just used to it and you don't really think of it as a high? I'm just trying to distinguish between like somebody transitioning and waking up feeling like the cotton has been removed from the brain versus somebody who gets used to being keto and how they're thinking day to day. Well, yeah, it's good. It's, it's, that's a very good question. Um, I probably more the, like, I'm not as aware of it maybe because it's my new normal as they like to say. So, you know, it's not a big change all of a sudden. Uh, but, um, you know, again, if I slide, like having that croissant, you know, I'll feel a bit brain foggy the next day and so on. So I realize there's still something else there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my sixties now. I'm pretty high functioning guy. I've got about, you know, five or six different jobs I do, including, you know, running a foundation and I have my own public con uh, consulting business in the business sector. I was a director of innovation entrepreneurship at my university and a professor and a so my brain's kind of going all the time and, um, you know, I'd like to think it's fueled up properly. So, uh, I, I, I would, I don't know if I've got, cause I'm a sample size of one, so it's not science, it's anecdotal, but I would like to think that the fact that I'm in, I take no drugs, I'm in, um, you know, 
arguably perfect health. You know, I, I get my um, annual um, medical every year and nothing changes. You know, I, I should be dead, right? Because I've been eating like 60 to 70% saturated fats for like a dozen years and I should be dead of a cardiovascular accident by now, but totally fine. All my numbers are totally normal. And uh, I was I was about 27 pounds heavier when I started this, which is why I started. You know why I started, Jesse? I was sitting there, watch TV with my wife and I had a beer and I uh, balanced it on my belly. And I said, look, honey, I can balance a beer on my belly. <laughs> and I'm just going, that's probably not a good thing. And I thought, yeah, you know what? So it was shortly after that, I met Dr. Matthias who turned me on to this. And then I thought, now well, let's try this as an experiment because I wanted to experiment on myself first to make sure it was safe. Um, so I did that and I lost 27 pounds in the first, uh, uh, and I'm not a, I'm not a big guy. I was never, I was actually just pushing up against overweight, uh, certainly not obese, but I had a belly and I was, you know, 50 ish. Um, and, uh, it all went away in, in 12 weeks and I weigh, I think I was 177 then and I weighed myself this morning, I'm 149 pounds. So yeah, I usually, you know, between 149, 152 and that's probably just water you know, more or less depending on how much I've been exercising. Um, and it's just, you know, so as long as you maintain it, that's the great thing about it. Remember I said, if you're obese or overweight, whatever you do to lose it, you got to keep doing that. So that's what I've done. I've just kept doing it. And as long as I keep doing it, my weight stays the same. So I don't really want to experiment with if I went back to a high carb diet, would I gain weight again? Because to me, that's just getting that whole axis of illness started again. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I know part of the catalyst for your change, you share the story in your book of being, I think it was at a hotel gym yeah. and you were, you were changing and you saw in the mirrors around you, you're surrounded by mirrors, an angle that you didn't typically see day to day. And it triggered for you this epiphany moment and, and was a catalyst for, you know, making a big shift. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually at a, it was at a meeting of an anatomy and physiology professors and uh, it was off, you know, at a. Vancouver Island, I think, at a kind of hotel thing we were meeting at, and I was down in the gym and had a swim or something, and yeah, it was, I because I was new to the place, they had mirrors all over the place, you know, where you're washing your face and combing your hair and all that, and I just got a glimpse of this other guy, got it sort of from the back side, and I could see these, you know, love handles and kind of stuff, and I just thought, oh, that poor guy probably needs to spend some time in the gym. <laughs> I realized it was me, and I do, I was spending a lot of time in the gym, so it was nothing to do, like, I worked out all my life. It was nothing to do with uh, spending time in the gym. It was all to do with changing diet. It was, again, around that same time. Um, so, you know, look for the signs in life. You know, if, uh, again, if you sort of look at yourself and you go, I got to make a change, well, then you have to make a change. So, you know, don't, I can't, this is what worries me about the, the semaglutide and these new, you know, diabetes management and weight management drugs is I think what a lot of people want is they want to have the life they have now, which is, probably not getting enough exercise, probably too sedentary, probably eating a lot of sweet, tasty foods that aren't good for you, probably drinking a bit too much. And they want the pharmaceutical industry to give them a pill they can take that'll make it all go away. And the pharmaceutical industry, no surprise, is obliging. Now, this isn't a pill. It's actually injectable. And you have to inject it once a week. This is the semaglutide. And it's expensive. Like in the States, it's $1,300 an injection or something. Uh, but it works, and it works actually by, you know, affecting those same satiety and hunger systems in your body, so you don't you don't feel hungry. But as people say, I, I, uh, another person I was counseling as a physician uh, said, you know what's great about this diet? I'm I'm a, he's an emergency room physician. He said, is I don't get hungry. Like I'm often on shift for 12, 14 hours. And I you know if I take a break, it means somebody's not getting the attention they need, and I can do the I don't get hungry. Because you're moderating those hunger and satiety signals and you're not depleting your glucose stores because you're burning fat all the time. So it's kind of having the same effect without having to inject yourself with a, with a foreign chemical that is going to have side effects and cause negative. And those negative effects of semaglutide, by the way, you know, you can go right on the site, Novo Nordosk, and the first thing it says is, you know, this can give you thyroid cancer. Why risk that when you can just change to a healthier diet and have a better effect with all these other beneficial effects of ketones rather than just it? And you know where it's really popular? Hollywood, apparently. It's like the thing in Hollywood, the de rigueur drug is everybody's on semaglutide and it keeps them slim because they got to be on camera. Again, you know, I don't know if you have any Hollywood folks that watch your show, but if they do, 
you know, talk to me. I can help you out without having to inject drugs. Uh, and let's do that. It's healthier. First, first, do no harm, right? First, do no harm. For somebody that's brand new to this and they start going lower and lower carb, they're getting into that zone where they're getting into ketosis through nutrition. Do you recommend at that point that they do some kind of testing to see if they're there? You met, We've talked about, you know, the Harper... What is it? The Harper Harper High. Harper High. <laughs> so they may feel that, and and then at that point realize that they're getting into ketosis. But if they don't, or they're not sure if they're feeling that, do you recommend to people at least in the beginning to test to see that they're producing ketones to get the benefits that are associated with those? Yeah, excellent, excellent question, and good point. Because um, I, again, in the book, I, I, I that's the first thing I do. I say, here's all the things you should do. Here's all the things you can measure at home which is, you know, a tape measure or a scale or whatever. Um, and then here's the things you can go to your physician and ask them to look for. Most of them are just standard blood panels and so on. But what you need, everybody is different. Our genomes are different. Our gut biomes are phenomenally different. Like there's huge diversity between our gut biomes. Uh, and, and we all have in individualized uh, reactions to different foods and nutrients and so on. So everybody is essentially their own scientific experiment. So the only way you can do an experiment is try and control and measure variables. So what we're changing here is the diet. What we want to do is see the effect of that diet. And in order to do that, you have to have a baseline measurement, right? Like that's, a, it's a linear study with a baseline measurement. And so, you know, in the second half of the book, I talk about the different measurements and what they all mean and, and how you can do that. So you should do that at the start. And you know, what I don't want people to do, what I try and counsel people not to do is don't worry on a, on a day-to-day basis. Like if you have a ketone thing, you want to measure your ketones. You know, that's what we do in the clinical studies. That's great. But don't weigh yourself every day because that's going to fluctuate a bit. And people kind of, you know, if they're OCD biased, they're going to become obsessed with that. Um, so, but maybe at the end of each month and then at the end of the 12 weeks, do all that blood work again with your physician. Um, one of the other tests you can do if you're interested in losing body fat, which most people are, is uh, something called a DEXA, um, which is a dual X-ray absorbitometry. Hope I pronounced that right. Um, and uh, it's essentially what they do for, for um, bone density as well. So, uh, you know, postmenopausal women have probably had or may have had a DEXA test where they, uh, it's a low level radiation and they can see not only your lean to fat composition and your bone density, but they can also see where that is deposited on your body. And where you don't want it is mid-abdominal. You know, women are kind of lucky in this regard in that they tend to put weight on more on their hips, which has less health consequences. Men, for sure, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the beer belly, right? And that's what you, you don't want to have. Um, and so you can see where it's deposited and, and that should change significantly over, over 12 weeks. I went, I can't remember where I started, 20 odd percent. I went down to around uh, 12% and then over time down to about six or 8% body fat. Um, and I still have, you know, not completely, you know, a um, little roll, I guess you'd call it, but most of that is just the skin that used to be <laughs> covering my belly. And, uh, you know, I kind of look like an old cat, you know, <laughs> skin hanging down. But that tightens up over time, too, if you're lucky. <laughs> what I'm trying to get at here is you make this distinction between being in ketosis versus just being low carb. Yeah. Okay. And so you talk about basically along the journey, you take people through different steps of beginning, middle, and then hopefully what they're going to continue for life. And then at that point, people need to decide whether they just want to be low carb or take it a step even further, what we're talking about here being in ketosis. And that's why I bring up testing to see if you're actually in ketosis, because going low carb might be enough for certain people and they might lose the weight they want to lose and they might feel good there. But there are additional benefits of taking it all the way down to ketosis. Yeah, I would say it's also an excellent follow up question, Jesse, I would say you know, get sugar out of your diet, right? Um, get as much of the high glycemic carbohydrate out of your diet as you can. Um, and, and get those seed oils out, which is pretty easy. Um, and, and, and the processed food is a bit tricky because processed food is convenient. So you are going to have to spend more time and think more about food, which we probably should do anyway. And you're going to be preparing more food because, you know, the foods you want to eat are, may not be as readily available. Um, so, so 
you there is a difference between low carb and ketogenic. So in order to be ketogenic, and it's variable between individuals, but you probably need initially less than 50 grams of carbohydrate per day. So if you want to try and measure that in the foods you're eating, go ahead. But again, because this is going to be a lifestyle you're going to adopt for life, what I would prefer you do is just find different foods to eat on a regular basis. We're pretty habitual in the kinds of foods we eat. And I have actually, um, it, it comes from Taryn, one of our uh, the dietitians in the study from Ohio State University, um, uh, in the, in the book, it's actually on the website too, biodiet.org. If you go there and go to resources, it's got like a shopping list and of, of foods you can eat, including meats and vegetables and all that stuff. If you just eat that stuff, you're probably going to be fine because it's devoid of seed oils and sugar and processed foods. So if you can find, and, and by the way, my book is not a recipe book. Um, I, I didn't want it to be, it, and it doesn't look like one. It looks like a science book. Cause that's what it is. A science book for everyday people. Right. Um, so if you're doing all that, getting rid of the sugar, the high glycemic carbs and and the processed food, you're probably going to be low carb anyway. And if we can get that far and that's as far as you want to go, then you're going to be way healthier than you were before. If you truly want to benefit either in a therapeutic way, so our research is actual therapeutic benefits for sick people based on the ketone levels in their body, you need to produce ketones. And in order to do that, you have to be in a state of what we call nutritional ketosis, which means your carbohydrate levels are lower than would be needed to maintain that baseline glucose level in your blood. So you're going to stimulate gluconeogenesis. You're also going to stimulate ketosis. And that you can then measure in several different ways. So we talked about the acetone, the acetoacetate, and the beta-hydroxybutyrate. So there are breath um, methods of measuring ketones. There's products that do, and they measure acetone levels, and um, they're very low acetones metabolize very quickly. Acetoacetate is in the the urine test strips. Um, the problem with those are that once you keto adapt, those go pretty much to zero because you just metabolize them so quickly. Your body's adapted to them. So people go, I don't think I'm in ketosis. You know, I'm two months into it. I'm using the test strips that are coming out zero. That's probably okay. It's because you're burning the ketones now, right? They're not getting into your urine. Uh, so the best way to measure, of course, is 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 with a ketone. Now you can get ketone tests. They're like those glucose ones. They actually puncture the skin and get a little micro drop of blood and measure that. That's you know kind of painful and probably unnecessary on a daily basis. But if you want to go that far, you can buy those things and do them. The the, the units are kind of cheap. They're they're kind of like those printers. You know, they give you the printer and then they sell you the cartridges at obscene prices. So the the, um, the device is pretty cheap, but then the little things you put in to read the ketones are kind of expensive. They're two bucks a pop or something. But if you did that once a week, that's fine. I don't, I don't hardly measure mine ever, but whenever I do, uh, uh, it's always like two, which is pretty darn good. For our clinical studies, we try and keep the women between 0.5 and 2, which means they are in a state of nutritional ketosis, which means the diet that they're eating is is uh, low enough in carbohydrate that they are actually producing ketones. So that would be the target window if you really want to measure that stuff. Um, that's pretty sophisticated. But like I say, you know, some there's a lot of biohackers out there, you know, that they, they kind of geek out on all that stuff. Go for it. You know, if you have the money and you want to do it, uh, that's, the, that's your target window. And you want to stay there as much as possible. Um, and by the way, you know, people, another question that comes up, Jesse, often is, uh, what about cheating? Can I do cheat days like the five and two diet? You know, I'll go keto for five days and eat what I want on the weekend. Um, you know, good luck with that. It's, it's probably not going to work. And in fact, it could be dangerous because of that rebound inflammatory effect of eating carbohydrates when you've been, um, under, so it's almost like, it's almost like yo-yo dieting. Um, you're stressing your body unnecessarily back and forth in and out of ketosis, uh, better just to go there and stay there. And as I said, there are, there, you know, people that don't like what I'm saying will say, well, again, long-term studies, all the long-term studies show that you can stay in ketosis for as long as you want. And uh, babies are born in ketosis and they stay in ketosis as long as they're breastfeeding and there's, you know, sugar in the breast milk, but they still stay in ketosis. So uh, there's no harm in maintaining uh, a ketogenic diet. You don't lose bone density. In fact, it may be good uh, you're not going to die of a heart attack. You know, it's, uh, you're not going to, you know, because you're eating saturated fat. Um, uh, but it is wise to have your physician monitor things because you never know what kind of reactions you could have or what's causing them. So, so we know 
from a diet perspective, if we want to get into ketosis, we need to be mindful of carbs and really bring those down. So we've gotten into what to eat. Let's talk about the when to eat piece. This is the other variable. We can narrow that eating window and keep blood glucose more at bay for longer just by narrowing that window. How do you feel about that when it comes to ketosis and when you're working with people, bringing that in as a tool? Absolutely. I actually have a little clock in my book that's on the website too. It's all free. You don't have to give me your email or anything that shows you when you should do what. Yeah, narrowing the eating window is great. And, you know, there's the OMAD, one meal a day. You know, if you, the, the only issues I have with any kind of, it, it's essentially a type of intermittent fasting. You still have to make sure you're eating enough food that you're getting enough calories and you're getting all the nutrients you have. So if you're restricting how much you're actually eating, that's a problem. If you're restricting when you're eating, it's fine. And, and I think, and, and I'm speaking uh, um, uh, on behalf of what I've learned from Dr. Crystal is, you know, narrow your eating window down to about eight hours a day is, is pretty good. Um, and that you probably derive most of the benefits from that. Um, and I don't think there's any harm in doing a fast once a week or once a month or something like that, because you have those other days when you can get the nutrients uh, that you need. Um, but don't take that to extreme. Like I hear people, oh, I'm doing a three day, I'm doing a five day fast. I'm doing a seven day fast. Well, after about two or three days, you start triggering, we call them selfish genes, which are the genes that Think now that you're in starvation mode, and what they'll do is they'll they'll slow your metabolism as much as 40%. So your metabolism is what's going to burn off that excess weight, if that's what you're trying to do. So you're working against your own best principles. But eating windows, shorten that. Now, the other thing is you shouldn't eat much of anything other than just drink water within a few hours of going to bed, two hours at least, uh, going to sleep. And there's a couple of reasons for that, but one of them that is not well known is that uh, most of the growth hormone you release. Now, growth hormone is released from your brain. It's very important for, uh, obviously for growth, but for regeneration, repair, for staying healthy and so on. Most of that, like I think it's about 80% is released in the first sleep cycle. Um, and I, I think you've had some people talk about sleep on your show, but you know, you go in these sleep cycles, there's an architecture to your sleep and you go into deep sleep and then you come out of it and you go into REM sleep and you go in and you wake up a little bit. So it's not, you just go to sleep and you wake up, you go through a kind of a, an architecture and it's the first deep sleep phase, which is the first hour and a half sleep for most people. That's where about 80% of your growth hormones released. Now growth hormone release, it's actually one of the few hormones that has a growth hormone releasing hormone and a growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So it's very tightly controlled. And if you, one of the things that the growth hormone inhibiting hormone uh, responds to is increased blood sugar level. So if you eat a lot of carbohydrate like pizza and then go to bed, you're going to raise your blood sugar level. That's going to cause growth hormone inhibiting hormone to be released at just the point during the day when most of it gets released. And it doesn't compensate as far as we know. So that's to be avoided if you want to optimize. We talked about optimal health, ultimate, ultimate health. If you want that ultimate health, you shouldn't eat anything within about two hours of going to bed. Well, any you could do um, you could do fats and proteins; they won't affect it much, uh, but not anything with sugar. So there there are some um, like uh, sort of protein shakes and things, and and actually Dr. Volick has has written about those like um, that you can do just before you go to bed. And the reason for that is the protein shakes have uh, different kinds of amino acids in them, um, and some of them are absorbed more quickly like the type you get in whey, and then some of them like in casein protein, they're absorbed more slowly. So if you want those proteins to be there during the repair and regeneration, I think most people know you do that while you're sleeping, then you want to have a, a, a nice healthy amount of those amino acids in your system uh, when that growth hormone is released because growth hormone stimulates the protein synthesis that does that regeneration repair. So don't eat fats and carbohydrates, but especially if you had a, a workout, uh, just before you go to bed, you can eat a protein shake as long as there's no carbs in it, right? Um, and, uh, you know, there's a different mix. Um, there's uh, basically sort of 50-50 casein and, and, uh, and whey is, is, is pretty good for that short and long-term uh, presence. Uh, but if you want to do one right after a workout, uh, again, this is referring to some of Dr. Bullock's work, 25% soy protein. Um, soy isolate protein, 25% uh, whey and 50% casein 
that's they've been working with um uh they've been working with uh, athletes and so on like college athletes and like and they're, they're getting the best benefits from that after workout like right after workout uh again no carbs in there um just fat and protein so you can put in your mct oil you can put in your full fat cream and, and mix that up with the protein and whatever you know water whatever you want to do uh and that'll that'll have some benefit there so that's that's one of the things the other thing uh, Jesse, to think about is is the sensitivity to insulin. So that's not constant during the day. In other words, insulin has greater effects at some points and lesser effects at other points. And one of those points that has a lesser effect is right before you go to bed. So again, don't eat sugar before you go to bed. Um, and I think somebody, Cynthia, I think was referring to to somebody. She said, "Oh yeah, he has this big like carb thing before he goes to bed." And I go. Yeah, how old is he? And she goes, and he's twenty eight years old. And I go, yeah, well, he's twenty eight years old. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it was her son. Oh yeah, okay. So he's invincible at twenty eight, but wait till he's forty or fifty eight. Um, I wouldn't recommend it at that age. So, um, uh, it, but in the morning, you're more insulin sensitive. So if you're going to have something that has carbohydrate, now I I usually eat like a handful of berries every day because they're loaded with phytochemicals that I think have benefits. Um, kind of like Dr. Lee and, you know, the green tea and other things that he's talked about. Same idea. They're anthocyanins, you know, uh, um, that are in blueberries, for example. And so I eat like strawberries, blackberries, and blueberries. I try to get ones that aren't too sweet. So I'll eat those in the morning because we're more insulin sensitive. So your insulin's going to have a greater effect. So you need less of it to have the same effect. And that prevents hyperinsulinemia. Um, otherwise stay hydrated. Like, um, if you think about water and I talk about that in the book as well. Um, you know, we talked about the, the the standard, you know, what do you do in the morning? Well, before any of those cornflakes and and toast or whatever, people probably have a cup of coffee. And coffee is a diuretic and alcohol is a diuretic. So, so you get up in the morning and you're dehydrated because you haven't been drinking during the night. Maybe you got, you know, water by your bedside or whatever, but not very much. So you're dehydrated. First thing you do is have a diuretic, which makes you more dehydrated. Right. And then you try, and then, you know, during the day you're probably working and you're not drinking enough water. And then at night you start drinking alcohol, which is a diuretic. So you're losing excess body. So you go to bed dehydrated, you dehydrate during the night, you wake up and dehydrate. So to counteract that, start the day with like as much water as you can tolerate, you know, start with maybe half a liter of water, try and drink like a half a liter of water first thing in the morning. It'll actually help you wake up and it'll help your bowels move and all that sort of thing. Uh, but it helps you wake up. And then just just remind yourself to stay hydrated during the day. Not everybody is as sensitive to how much water they need. And as you age, you become less sensitive to those thirst signals. So especially as you get older, if you're over 50 or whatever, make sure you're deliberately drinking lots of water. So I have my, my tea here and I have my water here. And, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're both handy. I always have water around and try and uh, just every time I see it, I just drink it and refill it. Right. So it's always there for me. You've brought uh, up that, that hydration piece a, a couple times, so obviously really important. And I know from a general sense, you know, health and wellness to maintain that, you want to be hydrated. But does that become more important when somebody's adopting a ketogenic diet? It it does that, and 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 the salts too. So, um, you want to stay well hydrated because that just all our all our systems are are water based systems, and it just the more water is great. It helps with your kidney function and helps you know flush out any. Uh, toxins or any um, thing you don't want, in, any excess that's in your body, your kidneys deal with, right? Or, or your liver, sometimes your lungs. Um, but also salt. So one of the things that um, you have to be wary of is, and this is something that um, that almost no, you know, clinical practitioners or physicians are aware of, is the effect of insulin on salt regulation. And when I say salt, I'm talking about sodium. So one of the powerful effects of insulin I didn't mention earlier is it reabsorbs salt from the kidneys. So so that means the salt is coming from the urine back into the kidneys, from what will be the urine uh, back into back into the blood, rather. Excuse me. And where salt goes, water follows. So when you have insulin that's too high, you're reabsorbing too much salt and you're reabsorbing too much water. And what that does is that salt and water has to go somewhere. It goes in your blood vessels. And so you're adding volume to your blood vessels. And that's a closed system. Um, so there's a, a, a physics law about blood flow called Poisset's law. And what it says is that your blood pressure is directly proportional to your blood volume. 
And that's why physicians, when you have high blood pressure, the first thing they say is, well, let's get salt out of your diet, sodium, because they know then the water will follow out and it'll lower your blood volume. Or they might prescribe something like hydrochlorothiazide, which is a diuretic, which will, which will make you pee that extra volume out. Um, but you're kind of dehydrating yourself when you do that. And so when you adopt a ketogenic diet and you're moderating your insulin levels, excess salt is going to leave the system and you probably need to add salt to your diet. So if you feel a craving for salty things, eat them. Um, and that, that's just sodium salt. There's also potassium salt, magnesium salt, calcium salts, and so on. The other two that I think are, uh, well, I'll just talk about one today, uh, is magnesium. Magnesium has about over 200 different important metabolic functions. Uh, it, it's not metabolized for energy, but it combines with other elements and it's involved in the metabolism in, a, in a, an important way. Um, most people are magnesium deficient. And so uh, you should add salt when you want. And by the way, the recommendations for salt, again, the public um, health recommendations are probably way too low if you have a healthy diet. Um, I don't think, I, again, they're looking at it in terms of lowering blood volume and you can do that with a ketogenic diet anyway. And you probably don't need a diuretic if you have high blood. That's why people that are hypertensive, they might have to reduce their antihypertensive medication because they're correcting it by correcting their insulin levels in the blood and that corrects their salt levels. So going back to a healthy, healthy body, right? So magnesium, um, the one I recommend is called magnesium bisglycinate. And the reason for that is some formulations of magnesia affect your digestive system. Uh, you don't want magnesium oxalate, which is milk of magnesia. You know, that it's a anti-constipation <laughs> kind of thing. You don't want that. Um, that can have the same effect as MCT oil for some people. Uh, but magnesium bisglycinate is a formulation that is easily absorbed without upsetting your stomach. And it's actually, and, and I'm still experimenting with this myself, there is suggestion, I would say, that it can help you sleep, help improve your sleep. So what I do is I take it right when I go to bed. I have my glass of water there and I take my magnesium bisglycinate. And it's not very expensive. And I take that once a day. And I, I get make sure I have lots of potassium too. Uh, it's hard to take that in tablet form because you need a lot of potassium, like about three grams a day. And you know if you're taking that in tablets, it'd be about 30 tablets. So don't try and do it with tablets. Just eat foods that are high in potassium that you know aren't starchy. Um, any most meats are pretty good for that. Um, uh, and then the, the salt, just you know be liberal with the salt shaker. And and. A lot of those symptoms people experience during the adaptation period, the lightheadedness, the dizziness, headaches, digestive issues are because their salts are unbalanced. So my theory is, again, I'm not a physician, is just get more than you need and let your kidneys sort it out. And as long as you're drinking lots of water with it, your kidneys will be just fine. I'm so glad you brought up that salt piece. I wanted to make sure we covered that. So just to highlight what you said there, when you go lower carb, insulin's going to come down. We're going to expel more salt which is going to take water from it. So we're going to want to take in more salt through the diet and water to stay hydrated. Yep, to stay hydrated and and uh, and it also help moderate your blood pressure. I mean, one of the things that happened very rapidly, very consistently, as well as decreased blood sugar is, is decreased blood pressure uh, with people that adopt a ketogenic diet. Um, so you don't want your blood pressure to go too low, which is why you have, the, have to have this concomitant reduction of antihypertensive drugs or, or just don't use them. If it's a diuretic, you're probably not going to benefit. But again, I'm not a physician, so this isn't medical advice. I'm just sort of thinking scientifically about it. Um, but it's it's funny because I've talked to physicians groups and none of them ever learned that insulin causes salt reabsorption. It's pretty important because <laughs> managing salts is pretty important. That's it. Jeff Volokh always says, get the salts right. You know, Make sure you get the salts right and then you won't have any of those side effects. So I have a little section in my book about that too. It was a new piece for me when I came across your work. So thank you for that. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad there's a little, I mean, there's always, you can always learn something new anytime you have a conversation with anybody. And uh, so I want to ask you before we go, like, when are you, when's your book coming out? I've got, I've had a book out for a while. I'm working on another one. When's your book coming out? Yeah, no, no plans in the works right now. What I'm doing is keeping me busy. I'm loving what I'm doing. So I'm just going to keep on absorbing all the great information from the guests and their books and I mean, I'm still relatively young. I got lots of time, so maybe down the line, but no plans in the works. Well, I'm just enjoying what I do and I truly love it. So it's, I'm just going to keep doing what I do. 
keep keep doing it. But you know, again, looking at the people that you've interviewed for this show and and the um, messages that they have and so on, uh, I mean, you're in a very unique situation. That other than anybody who's listened to all your episodes, you've heard so many things from so many people. And, you know, you're a smart guy who can just synthesize all this stuff and come out with, you know, whatever themes, like whatever, I think people would really, I bet your listeners are listening. Yeah, yeah. So send a note to Jesse and say, Jesse, when's that book coming out? Because I'd love, I'd love to have, you know, from almost like you have a science background too, but from a journalistic perspective of all the stuff you've learned, uh, I think you would have a ton to share with people that isn't just my opinion or Dr. Westman's opinion, which are very similar, or you know, Dr. Lee's opinion. Uh, but it's but it's what you've come to understand about ultimate health, right? So the ultimate health book, I can see it. I can see it on the shelves right now. It should be great. I hear you. I hear you. I'm not opposed <laughs> to it. So maybe down the line. And another piece of that too is that when a guest comes on like yourself, oftentimes they have a book that I'm reading before the interview. I'm taking in a lot of that guest's previous interviews to kind of get some direction where I want to take things. And so there's a lot of knowledge up there. A big part of my week is taking all this in and conversing with people like you. So it's uh, it's all up there. So we'll see. Good. Well, I hope we can talk again soon. I, as I mentioned um, when we were talking yesterday, uh, we've been working on a three-year study uh, on the therapeutic benefits of ketogenic diets for women with metastatic breast cancer. This is in, uh, you know, I was I was uh, a visiting scientist at the BC Cancer Research Center here in Vancouver, and we worked with the team. We were doing the immunohistochemistry uh, on blood samples, and then the rest of the team is at uh, the Ohio State University. That's where the, the women were participants in the study. Uh, it's a kind of a pilot study, small sample size, but really, really exhaustive, really interesting stuff. Uh, and that should be, we've submitted what, our first paper of several for publication. So as soon as that um, gets, you know, triggered for uh, the, the go ahead for publication, I'd love to come back on and talk specifically about ketogenic diets and cancer and how that works, because uh, it's, uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. In short, you know, it's not a cure. Don't, you know, don't stop taking your cancer medications and go on to a ketogenic diet. But there are some uh, some very important therapeutic benefits that uh, and, and no adverse effects. So that's my short uh, summary, the, the pre-publication summary of, of, of that first study that's going to be published. I'd love to do that. Let's plan for that. I did want to get into cancer with you today, but we had a lot of other great bases to cover. And I think that'd be a great second conversation. So we'll do that. Before you, we part ways here, one other area that you triggered for me when you were talking about fasting and not going too extreme with it is extremity when it comes to the diet. That being the carnivore diet. There's two different extremes. We could talk about the plant-based vegan. We could talk about carnivore. But when it relates to carbs and lowering our carbs, naturally the carnivore diet comes to mind. So how do you feel for somebody early on when they're going to adopt low carb, using that as a diet to transition or even a longer term tool to really bring the carbs down, bring blood sugar down, bring insulin down. How do you feel about that? I'm totally fine with it. Um, you know, it's a, it, it will almost certainly be ketogenic uh, unless you're eating a ton of liver because there's quite a bit of glycogen in liver, uh, a little bit in muscle. So you're going to get some carbs from that. Um, as long as you ensure that you're getting, you know, a, a balanced diet. And as I said, that's why I eat some things like some nuts and berries and things, because there are phytochemicals in there that are beneficial, I, I feel. Uh, I do know anecdotally from my colleagues that have started to study people that have been on uh, carnivore diets long term, again, no adverse effects. So nobody's hearts have blown up or anything like that, uh, and tremendous benefits, I would say largely because they're probably in a state of ketosis. Um, so I, I, you know, I haven't tried it myself. I'm, I keep telling my wife, I need to try going carnivore for a while and see what happens. But I don't, I mean, I don't think there's going to be any further health benefit for me, but I, but there may be that I don't know about yet. So I haven't done that sample size of one experiment on myself yet, but I would say, uh, again, talk to your physician, but I, I think it's fine from a nutritional standpoint. What you have to remember is that, you know, if you're going to be, say, vegan and just get all your nutrients from vegetables, first of all, you're going to have to supplement because there are some things that are just not found in vegetables like B12, right? So uh, you don't, you shouldn't have to uh, 
um, on a on a carnivore diet, you might want to take you know some vitamin C if you think you're getting scurvy or something. I, mean, I would probably vitamin supplement while I was doing it, at least with C and B vitamins. But um, but it's so much more nutrient dense. Like like you know if you eat some like chicken liver or calves liver or something like that, it's just so much more nutrient dense. So you need to eat so little of it. Um, and if you're in ketosis, you won't be hungry all the time. So I think there 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 are certainly some tremendous benefits. But then you also have to weigh cost, you know, the, uh, by the way, on the vegan side of it, there's the vegan, I don't eat any animal products of any kind whatsoever, but then there's the vegan, I'm trying to save the planet kind of vegan. Um, so there's often some political things and environmental things attached to it. But from a health perspective, there's nothing unhealthy about a carnivore diet as long as you have appropriate supplementation and are, are monitoring those things. And again, talk to your physician, but I think it's fine. I've talked to, um, uh, who's the, um, the physician, I was on his show. Boy, I should remember. Dr. Ken Berry. He's been no, on the no, show too. Ken, yeah, I can. No, Ken too. But no, there's the other, um, that's why he's like really, really cut, a uh, big carnivore, uh, council guy. Oh, there's a we'll lot of them now. Our, talk about our next show. <laughs> Sounds good. One thing I want to highlight that you brought up, I'd never thought about. If you're taking in a lot of liver, the glycogen in there, I've never thought about it from that perspective. Interesting. Yeah, it's sugar too. And, uh, you know, liver's great. Like if there's one thing that has everything, it's liver, right? So uh, actually, I recall now that one of the, I guess, the sponsor of your show actually has a product that is made from offal, right? From the organ meats of cap. And it's- Who are you thinking of? It's like heart and liver and something oh, we, else. Uh, Kidney. Paleo Valley has, Paleo has Valley. a triple organ complex that I love. Yes. Tell them I want to try their product. <laughs> I can make that happen. Yeah, no, that that sounds great. And that, you know, I'm not I don't know anything about them. I'm not trying to sell their product for them, but but th you know, what we should talk about too is societal change and how we need more good ketogenic products for people as the number of people are going to grow consistently. Uh, that's another whole sort of we could talk about the you know, sociopolitics of ketogenic diets too on another show if you want to do that. Yeah, they have a lot of great ideas. We'll bookmark those for next time. One area I want to hit on before we part ways is the protein piece. When we start talking about carnivore diet ketosis, we have gluconeogenesis to consider there when we're taking in that much protein. So when it comes to carnivore, do you find or do you know a lot about whether those people are in ketosis with that extreme amount of protein? And then how do you feel about protein from somebody that's on an omnivore diet but consuming a lot of meat? Is that ever a problem kicking people out of ketosis? Uh, well, you know, some suggestion that excessive protein, some of the amino acids start getting turned into glucose, but uh, I think that will be self-regulated. I, I, one of the problems with excess uh, protein in your gut is it putrefies, especially in your lower gut. Um, but if you're carnivore, people think, well, you're just eating protein, but you're eating animal protein, which has fat. And the fat, again, is way more dense, right? Because think of, of jerky or whatever. You take all the water out of it and it's, there's not much left there, right? So, but fat is fat. Like a, you can't take any water out of a teaspoon of olive oil. It's not an animal thing, but or a teaspoon of butter. You can't take it. So, it, so that's what it is. So, it, so it's much more nutrient dense. And as long as you are not avoiding the fat, like if you had a lean carnivore diet and you just ate... Uh, kangaroo meat, which is super lean, uh, you die. Uh, there's something called protein poisoning, and it's so rare. People that eat rabbits, like there was cases in the north where they've only been eating rabbits, which is very lean, and they event eventually you'll die because of a pro what they call protein poisoning. Uh, it's a very extreme thing, but as long as you're getting lots of fat in there, so you know, eat the skin on the chicken, eat the fat on the meat, uh, you know, as I said, tallow and lard are great. Um, pork rinds done in large, fantastic, you know, chicharron, the, they call them in Mexico, uh, chicharron con carne with the meat on them. Fantastic. You know, that should be like candy for you. Uh, and that's all fine. As long as you're getting, I would just say, don't avoid the fat and don't try and go, don't try and go carnivore lean, just go carnivore high fat. It should be fine. I do find that is one of the things that come up a lot when I'm talking to people that do a keto diet, the fact that certain proponents of that diet think that protein and being mindful of it is an important part of staying in ketosis. And then you mentioned Dr. Westman. He's somebody that doesn't worry about that and doesn't think that's a factor to 
to stay in ketosis. So it just depends who you talk to. I was curious on how you thought about it. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be with Dr. Westman on that one. I think he, he knows his stuff there. And uh, from what I know of it from from uh, Dr. Crystal and Volok and so on, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, unless, it, unless it's like super, super just protein, because you do have essential fats you got to eat. So um, yeah, so I, you know, carnivores, uh, I'll, maybe we'll give it a try. Maybe we should do it together and see what happens. Have Before you ever done next it? chat. Have you ever done I it? mean, I've had days where I've gone heavier on the meat, but never, never straight up carnivore. No, but I'd, I'd like to try it. We'll try it together for a couple of weeks and see what happens. And then so have we'll a talk. A we yeah. can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm open to the idea. But Dave, really enjoyed round one. We'll do this again soon. We're going to link up bio diet, link up your social media, your website, everything in the show notes so people can check all that out. And uh, we'll be in touch and we'll do this again soon. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Jesse. And thanks again for the hard work you put into uh, helping bring uh, accurate information to the general public so that we can uh, help people have happier, health, ha happier, healthier lives. Thanks very much. Thank you. And thank you for all you do. Now that you're done my conversation with Dave, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Dr. Eric Westman. He's got a lot to share when it comes to weight loss using the ketogenic diet. I'll see you over there. I've had people, even if they're, they've been on uh, insulin for 20 years, get off the insulin. And there's a little